screen, the screen's visible. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for, for inviting me. <clears throat> so if we just sort of take a step back and we think about what policy scholars have been doing, I think it's fair to say that there have been for generations of policy scholars, a central research question that has organized how people did their research and how they thought about international relations and the policy implications of international relations. And this won't be a surprise to anybody here, but between the 1950s and the 1980s, that the fundamental question in international relations, think of hegemonic theory, embedded liberalism and so forth, was essentially about the stability of the world order and the threat of nuclear war. I was a PhD student at Columbia in the very late 1980s. And in the 1980s, early, early to mid 1980s actually, um, the Columbia was the, along with Harvard, the preeminent place to study Soviet uh, politics and to study things like international order. And the, the central question that really dominated how we thought about international relations and core policy questions had to do with bipolar systems, about the, the alliances that came and the economic questions were in many ways subordinate to this core question about the stability of the world order. Many of my friends at Columbia who specialized in Soviet studies were very disappointed in the late 1980s it was good for the world, bad for their careers uh, to have this, the, the Soviet system collapse quite as abruptly as it did. Uh, I still remember November 8th, 1989, a pivotal moment, Berlin Wall fell. And suddenly the core organizing problem in international relations for policy scholars was the post-communist world order. And, in, and, it, and people's assumption at that moment, uh, the kind of organizing work that people were doing what was being published in the journals, what was being published in the university presses was about democratic peace, about the spread of globalization. There was a, a sort of a very important set of work that essentially saw, Helen Milner was very influential in this particular set of work, a very important set of work that essentially saw the core problem of international relations about you know, how to think about this, this linkage between democracy and globalization. And they were thought fundamentally to be positively correlated. And there was a general perception in the 1990s that there was going to be this progressive transformation. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to put yourself back in time, but in the mid 2000s, a lot of people who were studying China in particular were extremely optimistic uh, you know, under uh, President Chen Zemin and, and the, the work that was being done by China at the time, that there was going to be this gradual evolution in China, where as China integrated into the world order, that what you would see in China is, uh, in some sense, increasing integration, increasing democratization, increasing rule of law. That was sort of a, the prevailing wisdom in the mid 2000s. Uh, it was at this point, for instance, that New York University ended up having very extensive negotiations leading to the establishment, for instance, of a branch campus in Shanghai, because the thought was, all right, you know, we've kind of gotten past a lot of the challenges that are uh, con you know, impeding US-China relations. China has now chosen economic openness and political openness is highly likely to, to follow. Several of you work on security studies. Uh, terrorism was of course seen as a special challenge, but it wasn't seen as a threat to the fundamental global order. I think those of you that are younger scholars, your generation's core problem, I think are, will be rooted in what I see as the fundamental tension between ongoing economic globalization, which has continued, and the political backlash to democracy. Uh, not just the political backlash to democracy, but the political backlash to globalization, and indeed a backlash to the US dominated global order, not just external to the United States, but even inside the United States. There's been a tremendous backlash to the idea of the US as leading the global order within uh, the United States. There's a very nice, 
front page article in tomorrow's Economist, if you get the Economist, that essentially, I think correctly, outlines one of the central problems of this next period is how much of a leadership role will the United States play? And my argument is going to be we don't know yet. And in fact, if the election in 2024 swings to the Republicans, I expect there to be um, a weakening of the, the liberal democratic order and a weakening uh, of, of security. Um, more on this a little bit later. Let me define a couple terms. Uh, I'm going to define globalization essentially as a system of international capitalism predicated on relatively free movements of capital goods, people, and services. And in the services, I will include information and ideas. So I'm defining globalization as, for example, somebody's ability in uh, Beijing to gain access to the New York Times. Turns out you can't do that, at least not very easily. So um, that's an important element of globalization that is, is, is restricted. More on this in a minute, but just in terms of the items on here, um, the free movement of capital, it turns out, has been perhaps somewhat surprisingly least controversial. Free movements of goods turned out to be fairly controversial. Free movement of people has turned out to be extremely controversial. Uh, turns out that widespread immigration is not generally popular pretty much anywhere. And perhaps somewhat surprisingly, uh, services has emerged, particularly uh, the question of information as, as another extremely controversial element. Now, just on the moment of capital, foreign direct investment probably essentially dominates the global system. And the reason I'm arguing that is that the movement of goods and the movement of services essentially follows from these, the, the movement of international capital. This is less true for people. I'll talk more about immigration in a minute. But essentially, I'm going to argue that the, the world system in terms of trade and goods and services is predicated first on this, this movement of, of, of uh, capital. And indeed, the uh, movement of capital accounts for trillions of dollars of this cross-border activities. More on this in a minute, but I'm going to argue, and Haley has done a lot of work in this space with us, that at this moment, there are, particularly in advanced economies, minimal restrictions on financial flows. And I think this undergirds this tension in the international system. Let me just highlight some work that um, some of us have been doing. And again, uh, my thanks to Haley for her role in this, in this work. Uh, for a number of years, I've been working on the regulation of international finance, international capital. Uh, we've got a large scale project that we have running with the International Monetary Fund, where we're measuring the extent to which countries have liberalized international financial flows. And the bottom line for most countries is that particularly in the advanced economies, with 50 being sort of the most liberal open system, uh, there's essentially almost no restriction of money, foreign direct investment flowing out of an economy. So if I'm Nike in the United States, the US government makes no effort to try to restrict Nike's investments in Vietnam. Um, and in turn, there are modest restrictions of money coming into the United States. Um, usually the restrictions are linked somehow to security, but, but they are relatively modest. But in emerging markets, uh, there, there's an important difference, which is particularly in emerging markets, there are re remaining residual restrictions on inward foreign direct investment. So for instance, Vietnam continues to regulate the terms of entry as does China of, of foreign direct investment into the economy. But on balance, there's very little restriction on money flowing out. Um, I, I don't have the Korea data in front of me, but Korea looks like almost all the other uh, OECD economies with essentially no restrictions on the foreign investment of Korean firms going out and modest restrictions on foreign investment coming in. 
What that has meant in, is that essentially there are about 5,000 or so global firms that have come to dominate the global system. And I'll show you some data here in a minute, but these 5,000 global firms, many of which of course are Korean as well as American, essentially account for much more than half of the international trade in the world. So the majority of trade in the world is dominated by these 5,000 firms. And in fact, the top 1,000 firms account for about 45%, I think, of global trade. These companies are so powerful and so big that they're difficult even for the United States or the European Union to regulate or to tax efficiently. Um, the United States is struggling mightily to engage with what might look like uh, an effective regulatory scene for either Amazon or Facebook, no meta, but so far somewhat un unsuccessfully. So even in a country like the United States essentially finds these very large firms in a, an extremely dominant position where the United States is essentially uh, negotiating with them, not mandating with them. Um, in some work with one of my Georgetown colleagues, Lu Zhu, uh, Lu, uh, an assistant professor at, at the business school, we were, were able to look at the universe of Chinese exports at the transaction level. And we found that, you know, the vast majority of trade in China essentially is accounted for by about a thousand firms. And these firms, I'll, I'll just show you some, some data on this. Um, these are the, the Gini coefficients. And the way to look at this is that the uh, 50th percentile of firms accounts for um, four hundredths of percent of the value of total transactions. And at the 99th, for the top 1% of firms, account for more than 60% of the value of exports, Chinese exports in the United States. And a, a key takeaway here, and here there'll be an important difference to Korea compared to the United States. Overwhelmingly, the exports from China to the United States are not by Chinese firms. Overwhelmingly, the exports to the United States from China have actually been foreign invested firms, some of which are Korean, of course, but most of which are, are American. And what that is essentially has meant is that the international trade system has been mediated by these extremely dominant firms. And back to fundamental economics, back to Ricardian economics, essentially these fundamental dominant firms are able to price their investments in a way that moves money away from where resources are relatively expensive, think of labor in the United States, to where labor is relatively cheap, think Vietnam. More on this in a minute. Uh, Haley, uh, thanks for access to these data. And it turns out Korean data look a lot like the Chinese data and look like the US data, but an important difference here, of course, will be, at least this is my guess, that it's overwhelmingly Korean firms that are mediating Korean exports. If anything, Korea appears to have even greater concentration of exports, under 1% of companies accounting for two thirds of the value of exports. But again, back to the Chinese example, um, it's actually the foreign invested firms in China that account for the majority of Chinese exports. So this, the, the, the core problem that the scholars in the 1990s and the 2000s were confronting, that is the spread of global capitalism and its linkage to democracy has essentially become a little bit of a nightmare for the people who in the period, you know, in the, in the 2020s, because the system of international capitalism has essentially generated challenges to the international order, such that collective action by governments is necessary to try to solve those problems, think climate change, commons degradation, but also security. 
But the economic logic of the system that we've developed in the 1990s and and early 2000s has been premised on these global firms, which are moving processes and systems to where factors are abundant and away from where factors are scarce. So think I'll come to this point in a minute. But if you think about the United States for a second, the key movement in the United States is that US firms are essentially moving against relatively highly paid US workers and instead are shifting overwhelmingly resources to places where uh, workers are less well paid. What this implies is rising intra within country inequality, but, and this is of course good for the international system, declining international between country inequality. So the gap between China and the United States in terms of inequality has shrunk. Certainly Korea has been one of the great beneficiaries of the global economy in the last 30 years. But essentially there's an economic logic that has been built into this system of free movement of capital, which essentially involves the ruthless reallocation of processes and at times people. So we've we've created this very efficient system, but this very efficient system is um, creating enormous political tension. The political logic of this radical economic transformation, however, is hostile to the economic project of, of this modern capitalism. So I think this generation's core IR policy problem is that the capacity of the international system to collectively solve collective action problems, security problems, environmental, is predicated on the efficacy of governments to coordinate uh, uh, internationally to solve these problems. But the core actions of these big firms and allocating global resources has undermined this capacity and has first of all, shifted income away, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, has shifted resources away from states, shifted income away from labor, and has created a political backlash against um, the people who are supporting the international system. At least in the United States right at the moment, it's extremely difficult to find political elites who are willing to defend the international system in a way that that um, that, that you would expect. A, a, a particular, in my editorial opinion, bad moment for the United States came when the United States failed to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, I think, by any reasonable assessment, is going to be an effective counterweight to the growth of China. Um, in terms of its economic power and maybe even in terms of its military power. But by the time the 2016 election came, even Hillary Clinton, who had been one of the early architects of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was forced to renounce this. Now, there are, of course, important winners from globalization, but um, more on this in a minute, the losers of globalization are concentrated in the United States, at least, in both their interests and in their passions. So I guess that the core point that I'm thinking should motivate a lot of the research of of this next generation of scholars is that the economic successes of this international capitalism system are undermining the core political foundations of the system. Voters are less and less willing to support international core cooperation as a solution to global challenges such that climate change, of course, you know, how can we not address climate change? But if voters are in fact unwilling to support international cooperation as a key piece of the solution that that weakens our ability. So then I think the core challenge is what policies do we propose and implement in that light? Uh, I will come back at the tail end to talk about some projects that I think are really very productive. But one of the more more productive projects uh, has been projects, has been a project by Mikhail Bechtel, uh, currently at Washington University, St. Louis, now going to 
Cologne in Germany and Ken Sheavey, formerly at Stanford, now at Yale, where the two of them end up trying to figure out, well, all right, if, if voters are unwilling to support international cooperation, what kinds of policies and projects would voters be willing to address and, and solve? Now, let me focus a little bit, if I may, on the U.S. As a, as a special case. And I think it's worth considering, partly because the U.S. has been a security and economic anchor of the Asia-Pacific Democratic Alliances. You probably know that President Biden is hosting today uh, sort of an alliance of democratic countries, some less democratic and some more democratic. Um, a little diversion into economic history and I think, I hope this, this diversion will be helpful to the comments I'm gonna make next. This is from a very famous paper published in 1987 by Angus Madison about productivity and growth in advanced economies. And I just wanna focus on the table 1A as sort of kind of the, the anchoring table, uh, 1B is relevant too. If we were to look at productivity growth between 1930 and 1950, the United States in this period led the world. The United States, uh, partly because of, of questions of, of war and crises, nonetheless, uh, was probably the most productive country in the world. And Table 1B is essentially the, uh, the so-called augmented joint factor productivity where you sort of look at unmeasurables. And by, by that, the United States was, was by far the most productive country. But as you can see, 1950 to 1973, and then from 1973 to 1984, the United States um, had decreasing productivity. And indeed, by table 1B compared to other leading economies, the United States essentially had decreasing productivity. Now, this next figure is going to be a little hard to explain, but I'll, please give me a couple minutes to outline it. It's from work by David Artur, a, a, a brilliant labor economist at MIT, and Duran Esmagu, an economist, a macroeconomist also uh, at MIT, Harvard, I think, excuse me. And what the graph is showing is wage growth in the United States between 1963 and 2010 by degree. So the, the, do, the dots here, the bottom dot is high school dropout. The next one is high school grad. The next one is some college. The next one is college grad. The next one is graduate um, degree. The striking thing about the United States between 1963 and about 1980 was that there was essentially no premium, no premium for going to college. The wage premium in the United States for a high school dropout was about the same as a wage the wage premium for somebody who was a, a college grad. And coming back to Madison for a second, essentially there was a period where the United States having built up tremendous factor productivity between 1913 and 1950 was in a position where people were able to gain relatively high wages, even if their skills were not particularly um, advanced or particularly good. And this was particularly uh, enhanced because in the aftermath of the Second World War, and the emergence and spread of communism, countries like China, of course, were, were essentially taken out of the world economy. Japan, Korea, of course, were recovering from the aftermath of the Second World War, and in Korea's case, the, second, the uh, Korean War. And of course, uh, Germany was in the process of recovery. So that there was an extended period of time when American workers with quite limited and relatively weak educational skills were getting pretty extraordinary premium. I've labeled this the make America great again period. And I'm doing that with irony because essentially the Trumpian rhetoric 
in the last um, three or four or five, six, seven years has been about trying to evoke a period where American workers received an extraordinary wage premium, even though American productivity was declining. There was this historical moment where you, there, you had this extraordinary premium, but this premium was an artifact of an, you know, a, a, chain, a, a historical moment in the international system. And the system essentially uh, transformed clearly, I think, for the better with the collapse of communism, the transformation of China and India into uh, economies integrating in the world economy. So there, there was a combination of rare and unrepeatable unre events that led to this extraordinary dominance of US firms and workers. But the wages paid to US firm workers were not really sustainable. And the reaction of US firms to the high wages of US workers was to essentially migrate production processes out of the United States into many places, China most particularly, but not just China. So you had this, this rare moment. Probably my most important point here is that US workers, US citizens, came to view the exceptional income and lifestyle of this period, these gains, as somehow natural somehow the, the, the proper state of the world. People came to think this moment where, geez, you could drop out of high school and make a very good living and buy a house and send your kids to college as kind of the way of the world. But of course, if you're a high school dropout in the United States and you've got a 10th grade education, now you're competing with people with 10th grade educations in India. And honestly, things are going quite badly. Um, the next couple of slides are about manufacturing export competition. And this draws on work again with Liju Lu at, uh, at, at Georgetown. What she and I have been able to do is go into the Chinese customs data and the US census data. And what you're looking at is a map of the intensity of export exposure, the deeper the colors, the more intense the export exposure. And in particular, what we're mapping here is the export exposure in the United States coming from China, but coming from not Chinese firms, but global firms, particularly American, but not just, uh, not just American firms. So the deeper the red in places like Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, the more exposure to international firm export. So the argument I'm making is US workers get paid this extraordinary premium, partly because of this strange international system that we had between 1950 and 1989. It comes to an abrupt end and it's US firms reallocating production out of the United States into the rest of the world that then creates export exposure for US workers. Uh, this next map is the export exposure by Chinese indigenous firms. And the, as you can see, there's not as much red. And in particular, there's not as much red in the North central part of the country, which is where the American swing states are. This next map is the difference between Trump's vote share in 2016 compared to uh, President Romney, the Republican, I'm sorry, would-be President Romney, the Republican challenger. And uh, in regression results, we show this, but I think the map, these maps uh, do, do a nice enough job here. So essentially Trump's rise is closely linked, not so much to the spread of Chinese imports from Chinese-based companies, but the spread of imports from US and other international multinational companies. So these 5,000 dominant companies have reallocated production from the United States to China, shipped resources and exports back into the United States. 
and good for them, their profits have gone up. But that then has created this global backlash, this backlash to the international system. And this backlash to the international system threatens the system that these 5,000 multinationals, international firms have, have um, benefited from. So in terms of what work there is for policy scholars in international relations, I think the bottom line at the moment of US politics is that international exposure to trade and finance, especially from international companies, especially American international companies, is strongly associated with the backlash in the US to the international system itself. And if President Trump wins in, in 2024, we will likely observe an even further retreat in, by the US from leadership in the international system. Um, certainly a, a scary trend in terms of IR and policy studies. Hence, I think, but you know, if, if I were betting as a young person, what kinds of research projects should I be focusing on that will be published in leading journals? I think this backlash to globalization and the global order will be the core problem facing IR policy scholars for the rest of this decade. Uh, I'm joining the editorial board next month of international organization. If you just sort of look what's getting published in international organization, that's kind of the core problem. It's, you know, it, what's happening with the leadership in the international system and will the inter can the international system essentially survive a, a, a weakened America? And if it can, what are the, the kinds of collective security and other kinds of actions that countries like Korea and Germany will need to undertake. Um, should I pause here? Because the next section will be about methodological challenges. Uh, I should have typed not changes, but challenges to the discipline. Um, but um, should I pause for questions or keep going? We still have some uh, about 10 minutes, I think. So uh, you, you can elaborate about the methodological issue here. Okay. All right. So I work with economists. Um, with my, with the department I'm in, I'm, I'm the vice dean of the business school at Georgetown. I work with a lot of very excellent economists. I had a preview, front seat row in some ways, of what was going to happen in political science. In economics, there was a, a causal identification revolution in the 2010s. And the causal identification revolution, I think, was predicated overwhelmingly on the fact that the standard workhorse of social science research, um, regression analysis, does have an important limitation, which is that it's open to manipulation, it's open to um, aggregation bias and other, other, other core problems. Since 2010, I think in political science, and it's really accelerated in the last few years, people have become ex increasingly um, skeptical of the utility of using cross-national data and I think people are also increasingly skeptical about country case study analysis, single country case study analysis. Uh, people are especially interested in construct validity and are paying a lot more attention to measurement error than ever before. So in the context of policy studies in IR, I think scholars are gonna increasingly need to attend to the micro foundations of policy work. Um, Haley has a nice paper that's forthcoming in international organization using data on Japan that, that looks at surveys. Um, and, and I think that a lot of work in international relations is going to be need to be micro founded in surveys or experiments. Um, I had a paper uh, with two co-authors that is looking at the determinants of exchange rates. I won't go into the details of this, 
But one of the things that was clear was that even though we have a clear cross-national story, we have uh, an election-based foundation, uh, we needed to, in, in addition, have something like a, a survey experiment to essentially have this paper be relatively uh, successful. So the experimental designs are increasingly important to journals and indeed funders in this. And so I think as people are looking at their, at their, at their research portfolio, I guess I would be particularly uh, advocating that you pay attention to um, trying to have multiple methods, particularly involving some sort of experiment or some sort of unique survey to, to advance your work. I think, I'm not sure if, if people are following the global research and international political economy. That's, a, that's something that's come out of New York University. Uh, um, Peter Rosendorf, Lena Mosley at Princeton, and um, Stephanie Rickard at the London School of Economics have organized this. And I think that these folks have done an excellent job in showing us where the frontier of um, research is going. And let me just, just flash three different research studies with three different designs. And I, and I think this is kind of where, 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 where things are going. All right, I'm not able to actually get this to, to launch from inside. Uh, there was a, there's a, a nice paper uh, Dan Nielsen and his co-authors presented this. So I was going to actually show you the, the sort of outline of the, of the paper. But the, the, the big idea of this paper was that, and they received a multiple million dollar grant from uh, several funding agencies, including the U.S. Um, agency for International Development to do this. What they ended up doing was trying to create an experiment, a series of experiments, looking at tax evasion and tax fraud. And in this extremely clever experiment, what they, what they essentially did was create shell companies and then write to multiple governments, multiple tax agencies, multiple banks, banks in particular, and in, in the banking one was, I think, the most interesting, and try to essentially set up shell companies that would engage in various kinds of tax evasion. So some of the core questions that we, we need to answer in international relations are going to require extremely sophisticated experiments. Uh, I apologize, this worked at, this worked for me um, earlier today, but it's just not working today, right at the moment. I'm just not able to, just not able to pull, pull up these things. Um, I think I'll stop there. But you know, my core, core argument is there are important challenges to the international system that are arising because of this tension between these global firms and our ability to not regulate these global firms. They're weakening the foundation of the international system and they've weakened the support in the United States for the international system. Uh, and then the second thing is, there's a methodological revolution in international relations. And I think this methodological revolution is gonna be shaping how people are gonna be doing business. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for your, say, the uh, very uh, insightful as well as informative, the special lecture for the younger uh, scholars here. I think the uh, Professor Ken, uh, have done a superb job to trace some some even if it's stylized form the uh the historical evolution of the global capitalism from the say uh during the golden age of the uh the relationship between the democracy and the globalization are the mutually reinforcing uh one so that the workers as well as the capitalists are getting a better wage and better profit here, but uh, it, it transformed into somehow the mutually undermining uh, the uh, relationship between the uh, democracy and globalization and, and in, in particular and the uh, international, uh, the 
order or systems uh, created by the United States as hegemon here. So now, the, as, as the Professor Finn said, the political backlash to uh, globalization, international system, as well as the domestic dem democracy is one of the important uh, the research uh, agenda for the coming uh, the generations of scholars. And also uh, the last part, the, we also the see that the, here's a, a ongoing, the very important methodological uh, revolution in terms of the causal identification revolution or the experimental uh, political science that, that was actually emerging when I depart from the, uh, the United States, I when I complete my PhD at Yale there. But anyway, so uh, I think the Professor Kim raised a lot of, a lot of important uh, point of discussion, as well as uh, raised a lot of uh, important questions as well. So uh, now I want to switch the gear toward uh, our discussants here. So we have two discussants today. Uh, first, uh, Professor Li Na Kyung at Seoul National University. Uh, I think you have uh, 10 to 15 minutes to uh, have some uh, raise some some point of discussion uh, about the special lecture of Professor Kian here. Okay, thank you um, for the great talk. And so I wasn't. Um, so I wasn't really sure what I um, should talk about during the discussion, sort of the discussion session, because this is not an academic paper, but I thought it would be good to sort of like mention some of the questions that sort of came to me while I was, um, you know, reading the initial paper and also attending the presentation. So um, I've also invited some of my graduate students to attend um, the seminar. So I hope that, you know, my question will um, sort of help them think about what kind of projects they should, you know, envision to work on for the next, um, you know, three or five years as they become or they transition to a PhD program. So um, I think one of the things um, that really sort of stood out for me from the talk was this um, methodological uh, revolution that you mentioned. And um, and I saw actually a lot of that, you know, just attending, you know, um, talks, conferences, and also looking at or reading leading journals from um, the from academia. academia. But um, my question is, so I, you know, in terms of causal identification, so if you're folk as a scholar, you know, I understand that it's important to think about causal identification and really think about um, how I can design my studies so that I can really cleanly identify what is causing, you know, what, you know, how X is leading to Y. But I was wondering if uh, Professor Quinn, you know, can talk, talk a little bit more about you know, this um, dilemma that students face in choosing their questions and research methods, because some of the, uh, I think, fundamental problem is that some of the interesting research questions are, I think, uh, rather difficult to um, study using these um, causal identification or exper especially experimental method. And I think one of the um, examples that I can think of is um, interstate war or, um, you know, like expropriation, because you can't really assign governments to, you know, randomly, you know, um, do uh, engage in policy actions so that you can study the effects of it. So I, um, so I think that was my first question that came from um, the talk and um, also the paper. And I think second point is related um but um not so closely related but somewhat related so so a lot of the studies that um you mentioned or are presented at gripe are u.s centric so essentially a lot of the studies look at u.s cases or u.s data um and i think so I understand that um, U.S. is important, and then you, especially U.S. and China-based studies are more predominantly um, found in these articles because these are, you know, the two most important uh, economies as well as you know the major powers. But um, I, but 
the sense I get is that there's this tendency to uh, marginalize non-US or China-based research. And from my experience, I had hard time, I had difficulty selling um, the study that, or the research that you mentioned during your talk, which um, is based on single survey in Japan. Um, and it took me four revisions to finally get it accepted at international organization. And I think one of the criticism or one of the critiques, I would say, is that it's based on single country. So it lacks or it's, um, I guess, deficient in terms of generalizability. So my next question is, how do we address this um, issue of generalizability? And is there any way around it, you know, when we have to deal with more US centric audience? And um, so, and then, Le sort of segueing to my third question. So um, so the, a lot of the talk was about backlash against globalization, right? But I wanted to hear more about, you know, this backlash, like what's the micro foundation of this backlash? So, um, so when there's a backlash against globalization, my understanding is that individuals have two options. You know, either they can demand their protectionism or they can demand for redistribution. So why is it that individuals have been leaning towards protectionism um, rather than asking for more redistribution, right? Because um, we see scholars talking a lot about the right wing populism, but wouldn't it be also po possible for a US or the European country to swing uh, radically to support left wing populism if they some, you know, somehow decide to demand redistribution or protectionism. Um, and so leading to my final um, question. So this is more practical question for graduate students who are in the audience. So um, so I hope that graduate students have more questions in the Q&A session because they're, you know, the ones who would have a lot of questions. Um, but so so I understand the advantages of experiments and it leads to really clean identification and you don't have to, you know, um, use all these like sort of regression um, sort of, uh, I guess, tricks or you have you don't have to um, refine or, um, you know, clean your data as much in order to come up with a clean identification. Right. But um, given that ex experiments are expensive, I think you mentioned that like some of the experiments could cost like multi million dollars. So is there any way for young scholars to be um, able to, you know, conduct studies with clean ident clean causal identification or experiments, but not worry about costs or somehow find resources so that they can cover um, the cost of doing experiments. So um, these are my four um, sort of points and the question, and I look forward to um, discussing these questions further. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Lee. Uh, I, I think the all of the four uh, questions are uh, very, very degraded student friendly uh, and practical questions for their the um, the future research here. So uh, I, I hope the uh, the Professor Kin uh, give us uh, some innovative solution for all of those questions here. And now move to the Professor Kim In Han. Now uh, you can you can raise your own point of discussion here. Again, my name is In Han Kim. Um, by the way, would you mind if I call you Dennis? Just instead of Professor Queen. Yeah. Okay, American style, right? <laughs> okay. Amer American style and Dennis. Yes, thank you. Yes, nice to meet you. Yeah. Okay, nice to meet you. All righty. Um, so I have about five or six questions, by the way. Um, uh, some of them are quite similar with what uh, Haley uh, raised. So uh, thank you for your presentation, Dennis. Um, this panel is designed to help us scholars understand our current trends and approaches of policy studies in international relations. And Dennis has just made an excellent uh, super presentation about research topics, potentially hot for the next decade or so. 
and methodological changes um, in the discipline uh, facing for uh, policy scholars. So thank you again for sharing your research project um, and for exposing us to uh, new trends um, in the field. And I'm happy to be part of this panel this morning. Um, and I have thought, and one thing I have thought uh, since I got a call from uh, this organization, the um, KAIS, uh, to be a part of, to be, yeah, to join uh, this panel. Um, I have thought that my role, my role today is not about making comments on Dennis' uh, presentation. Um, instead, I thought my primary role should be asking a uh, speaker uh, questions on behalf of scholars, both junior and senior who are interested in uh, policy studies. So I have about five, of six, five to six questions and um, those questions, I try to be, uh, I try to place myself in the shoes of junior scholars in the field of uh, policy studies and generate some questions. So the first question, um, that is quite uh, very general um, in nature. So it is a question about how to incorporate uh, theories into policy studies. Uh, I'm pretty sure that policy studies scholars have encountered uh, this challenge. It is frustrating uh, for the scholars to have comments from reviewers uh, saying that, oh, uh, this article is interesting, you're writing, your manuscript is great, but uh, it looks very uh, journalistic instead of uh, scholarly. Um, um, it's, it'll be frustrating if you took a lot of time and then submit it to the journal uh, expecting good um, result, but you know, once you have it, um, it'll be very disappointing. And that's uh, sometimes that happened to me a lot in the past. So for scholarly articles, theory you have besides everything, including hypothesis to be tested, uh, cases to be selected, and data to be collected, uh, etc. And for scholarly works, audience is limited to our colleagues. However, policy studies should be a different. It should have different approaches. A policy studies should be more practical than scholarly research. Audience will be more diverse. The audience will include people we meet in the, um, on street in daily lives. Uh, sometimes there are people in policies, policy circle and those people are not that interested in theoretical arguments. So extensive and intensive use of theory may make our work less accessible. So my question is, what your answer will be if somebody asks you, what's the role of foreign policy theory or international relation theory in policy studies? What would you say uh, to what extent and in what way we use theories in policy studies. So that is my first question. And the second question is about uh, methodology. Um, so through your presentation, you briefly mentioned that now we find increasing number of research works using experiment in political science in general and policy studies in particular. Uh, I'm very, I'm a very history-oriented uh, scholar. Um, I conducted archive works uh, for my uh, PhD dissertation. Um, and my primary research method is qualitative rather than quantitative or experimental. Um, I have to confess uh, that I feel myself losing competitiveness in terms of methodology. People are moving forward. And I'm feeling that, oh, just I'm kind of standing, just keeping my, just holding my position where I am. Um, but, you know, scholars, especially graduate students here uh, who prefer going with the um, um, qualitative method, you and I may be on the same page. But do you think, the other, I have a question to the other, Dennis, do you think the other qualitative approach is still survivable in the midst of a barrage of new methodological approaches to policy studies? And how would you qualitative scholars be able to survive in policy studies? So when I you know, talk about the, the methodologies, kind of advanced to one versus the historical or traditional qualitative things, I'm not sure whether you have watched the movie, A Last Samurai, like, which came out like 20 years ago, 
<laughs> it's about you know Tom Cruise thing, the other joining the samurai group, and the other um, he fought against the uh, advanced, modernized Japanese forces, and the other Tom Cruise kind of fighting with a sword and the other arrows, while the other modernized Japanese group just fighting with machine guns or whatever. Okay, so I feel like kind of part of last summer, last summer I think, um, <laughs> and so the uh, and the last the third question. Um, is about your presentation today, and which you didn't much talk. And I think the Haley already mentioned it uh, through the, you know, her question. So I was kind of curious when I read over your the, uh, note, uh, lecture note uh, today, just I was kind of interested in uh, more listening to your explanation about causal identification revolution uh, from economics. Uh, and I was kind of just wondering how the uh, uh, people out there are incorporating and using and adopting those ideas and you know, use it in the political science research. So uh, if we have time, if you can uh, provide some explanations or any examples for the, um, the things, that would be great. And another, the, the fourth question I have is in terms of the policy studies, uh, I, I totally understand that causal identification is very important, but for policy studies, Sometimes we may want to have better explanations, uh, some explanations with complete pictures for what happened. That being said, instead of the um, comparing the causal significance of competing explanations, we may like to have some people call kitchen sink approach incorporating many variables and many factors together, um, it may not look parsimonious. However, it provides good explanation, good description, and overall picture for what happened. So what would you have to say about kind of value between the you know, causal and you know, comparing causal significance, causal identification versus more like kind of kitchen sink approach? Um, and the, um, maybe the last question I have is, oh, you say, I think you the, um, mentioned it at the end of your presentation, any kind of scholarly works kind of people can think of as a model uh, for future research. So yeah, I'm going to skip it, but maybe the, um, the last the, um, question I have is, uh, when I listened to your the, um, uh, presentation, you mentioned that the, uh, the backlash of globalization, that will be a gold mine uh, for future for research for the next decade or so. Uh, I agree with that. I agree with you. Uh, but here's one thing I have to uh, share with you uh, and the um, main audience in this the, um, Zoom meeting. Uh, one thing we have to be careful about is uh, something which is hot today may not be that hot or popular in a decade or later. My experience, one good example, when I started the uh, uh, graduate study uh, back in Virginia in uh, like almost two decades ago, it was about the time when the United States went into the war against terrorism. So everybody studied the terrorism, uh, still terrorism is still a hot issue, but uh, many people also became interested in like nation building or military occupation, but in less than a decade, not many people studied the topic. I was interested in the uh, military occupation and in the um, nation building thing. So that's why I went into the um, uh, National Archives digging up the, um, the documents for US occupation in Japan and Korea. But when I came out uh, finishing dissertation, I just felt that, oh, wait a minute, and many people are talking about this. <laughs> so um, yeah, for deciding the, uh, deciding the future research topic, uh, that will be a critical thing for future generation of the IA scholars. And uh, anything, um, Dennis, you wanna suggest or anything for what students, um, future scholars need to keep in mind, that will be great. Okay, I think this is it for my DM questions. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kim. Here, so uh, I, I, I think uh, it's more like the your self confession about the your say some some I losing competitiveness <laughs> in in especially the methodological field here and all the other uh, questions, but uh, are very relevant and the very I think the helpful for the future generation of the uh, this field, especially the IL scholars here. So now. Uh, we already have more than 
at, at say the about nine uh, questions already have. So let's first have the, may, may I speak to uh, Dennis? Uh, ca can you first uh, respond to each question first? And then I will open the floor. So here. Yeah. Well, thank you for these these questions. I'll I'll take them in the order that that, that they came first with Haley and then in hot. Uh, I'm uh, I'm smiling because of course many of the challenges you guys face I'm still facing. You know, it's uh, you know the 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 um, overarching uh, challenges. Um, so when I write a paper, I I've got a mental model about not necessarily the topics that I'm going to follow, but a mental model about whether the paper will be successful in an elite journal. And uh, I, uh, the American Journal of Political Science has been something I've targeted or APSR or IO uh, or other. And my mental model essentially is, 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 is pretty simple. Uh, I think to get into an elite journal at this moment, you need some combination of the four elements. I think you need three of four. Uh, you need either new theory or a revision of new theory, new data, new methods, new results. And then um, you, know, you, you are just completely right about this. There's a, a fifth element, which is very ethereal, but it's how hot a topic is. And it, it, that, that kind of changes. At, and, you know, it's something's very hot at a moment and then, and then it, it shifts and then it's not so hot. But my experience has been that in order to be successful in, in these elite journals, you do have to have um, at least three of the four and have some broad sense of, of, the, of that fifth, and I'll, I'll come back to that fifth. Let me uh, sort of begin with, with Haley's comments about um, there being a range of questions that we'd like to address that don't lend themselves to clean causal identification. And that's true. That is absolutely true. Uh, and uh, I can think of a number of recent uh, scholarly efforts where people have undertaken very important projects where essentially what comes out of the work is not a clean causal story, but a preponderance of the evidence. And policy studies in particular, I think the lend themselves as a group to looking at preponderance of evidence studies rather than just exclusively causal identification. Uh, I read recently Sarah Burl Dansman's book on investment incentives, and she didn't have a clean, published by Cambridge University Press uh, in 2000. Uh, another very nice set of books was on bank and banking crises by um, Mark Koplovich at Wisconsin and uh, uh, David Singer at MIT. And those studies essentially, Haley, relied on preponderance of evidence. And so, you know, on balance, I think the journals at this moment are looking for a relatively clean story with sort of a single, single point. But university presses or academic presses are much more willing to uh, undertake these, these synoptic projects that lend themselves to this broader discussion. And so I think um, particularly, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself on this, uh, some of the work that I would like to get out is probably best done as a book that doesn't in fact have this clean causal study, but then shows the historical evolutions over, over the course, course of time. Uh, I'm, I'm taking things a little out of order, but in, um, I think particularly a lot of the qualitative work that people have been doing that um, is very important. Uh, we'll call it from henceforth the last samurai work, you know, where you're, you know, weighing against uh, uh, one of my Georgetown colleagues is uh, Diana Kim, 
She has a brilliant book, archival book called Empires of Vice, looking at the ways in which um, opium production was regulated in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, and why opium production disappeared and how addiction disappeared and what the, and there's no causal identification, excellent archival work, but she essentially creates this preponderance of evidence study. And I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a way that I think the people doing archival work that don't have these clean identification studies need to, need to go. I'm not sure in Korea with PhD programs, but in US PhD programs, maybe we're making a mistake in pushing people to have, say three essays or four essays. When, when I came out, uh, my dissertation, which was turned into a Columbia University Press book, was essentially a preponderance of essay, not three clean little identification, but um, um, so I think, there are some important questions that we do need to address that don't lend themselves quite so cleanly. And university presses and academic presses are, I think, uh, important ways to go. So too, by the way, uh, you know, some of the, the presses like Brookings or Peterson have done very important policy study work uh, that, that's been very impactful, even if it's not been um, um, cleanly identified. Uh, Haley, you're completely right. Uh, one of the frontier areas is to get out of the U.S. and to begin to look at other countries. We do see, in particular, in trade, there's been a giant pile of studies on, of all places, Belgium. Uh, another pile of studies on Switzerland. Why are we looking at Belgium? Why are we looking at Switzerland? It's because they have relatively clean data that can be exploited. And so if there are data, particularly in the East Asian context, then I think that would be very important. Uh, we'll see what happens with the paper that I have with Li Zhu Lu, but that project is premised on access to the Chinese customs data between 2000 and 2007. So I, I think you're completely right. We need to quit studying the United States. But a lot of the reasons why we are studying the United States is that the US put together pretty remarkable data. Uh, a guy at Georgetown named Brad Jensen was the person who put together the US census data that has probably been the underpinning of four to 5,000 studies um, in political science, economics, and sociology, because all of the micro data has, 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 has been there. So, you know, sometimes we're, we're just looking at the US just because of the ability to access data relatively cleanly. Uh, uh, there's also an awful lot of uh, economic data. And then, again, you're quite right on the generalizability point. Uh, you know, your paper on Japan and is, is a very important paper, but I, you know, I do remember people questioning how generalizable it was. Um, but but the, I think the answer to that is nonetheless to do the work in these interesting and different contexts because we learn a lot from that. And then it's kind of the burden on the reviewers and other people to ask that question about the, the generalizability. So a clean study using uh, data outside the US context, I think is something that we'll learn a lot. On the experiments, boy, you put your, your hand on, this, this is a, a much bigger question, Haley, I think than, than um, you're, you're even recognizing. So right at the moment in the United States, if I work at a rich university, and Georgetown is a modestly rich university, our endowment is $3 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but compared to Harvard at 30 billion, not 35 billion, not so much money. You know, if you work at a rich university, then, you know, faculty have access to $50,000, $100,000 research budgets that they can do these very complicated uh, surveys. Uh, I recently, with Thomas Sattler and um, Steve Weymouth, ran a survey of 5,000 respondents run simultaneously across uh, six countries, and I think that was $24,000. You know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of money. And so there's an inequity in political science, which is uh, amplified by 
um, not just the university you work at, but the age and the stage. So graduate students in particular that aren't at the, the richest universities uh, struggle to gain. I think then the solution is to do things that um, are more creative and are, are, are less, less costly. Now, let me, on this point, suggest there's, there's, there's a, a dead end. And let me highlight this dead end. The dead end, I think, is Mechanical Turk. So a lot of you, have been, a lot of people, myself included, have used Mechanical Turk. And I think it's useful for preliminary experiments. But I think whether uh, there are multiple platforms, but reviewers are increasingly doubtful that these relatively cheap alternatives um, have a, a sample in a pool that is is going to be rep representative. So, uh, you know, I think you have to uh, find new ways of trying to address these questions. Uh, one of the doctoral students at Georgetown, uh, I'm on her committee. Um, there's a new database that I mean, we looked in Web of Science. Nobody else has used this. So, you know, and of course you did this yourself. You know, you, you create a new database and you make it publicly available. I mean, a lot of ways you can offset the lack of resources through sweat equity. So, I, I, but you're right. It's, it's something that's not at all fair that's in the system. Um, uh, Georgetown's relatively rich as a university, but not everybody can work at a relatively rich university. And that's, a, that's an unfairness in the structure of the system. Um, and then uh, and on, on your questions. So back to the, I sort of led off with, you know, my little metric about the four key elements to get into a leading journal. I don't think you have to have news theory to get into an elite journal, but then you better have something like new methods, new data, or new results to, to offset that. Because you're right, there's kind of a cookbook. And one way to think about the journals is essentially you're running lab experiments and you need some key element to this in order to, to, to be successful. Uh, I'm particularly struggle, I'm, I smiled a little bit in your, your, your comment because I've got this very long running project dating back to 2007 with colleagues at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and it's a, a, Haley of course has participated in this project too. And we have an anchor paper and it, it's, a, it's a brand new database. It, we're showing new results um, that people haven't, haven't seen before. Um, and when we sent the paper to, to an economics journal, um, people say, ah, oh, this is really great data. These are really interesting results. You know, it's a, basically about what happens when countries reform their economies. So it's classic policy studies. Um, where's your new theory? So, you know, even at this particular point in my career, I'm still having people say, and where's your new theory? That's a challenge. It's a challenge. But then you've got to have these new results, new data, or, or, or new methods. You've got to have something else that sort of is, you know, helping to anchor. Or you've got to be in the book space. And I think the, the book space is, is, a, is a great space to be. In fact, um, if I had more time, I'd be pushing us to, to do this. Qualitative studies. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll turn to Haley here in a second because I think she has some observations on this. I think you can still get qualitative studies published in the elite journals, but the qualitative studies in order to get into the elite journals have to have an unusual research design that, that people really haven't haven't uh, haven't seen before. Let me give you a, a specific example from the sociology literature. Um, it's a very controversial study, but but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, Professor Guffman, uh, a sociologist who I think at the time was at Chicago, um, ended up traveling with uh, criminal gangs in the United States. So it's sort of a sort of a classic qualitative study. But you know, she was doing something nobody else had done before. So, and you know, there were important publications that came from this, although there was a controversy associated with it. 
So you just have to have an extremely good, unique research design at this point. Or back to Diana Kim's book on you know, empires of vice, this broader research project where you have these qualitative work, where you have this long argument that you can make. Now, let me make a particular point in security studies. Because security studies often involves singular actors, you know, nations that are at war or something like that, you know, qualitative studies are actually kind of the way you have to go in a lot of security studies cases. If you think of Graham Allison's famous book on, you know, you know, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, it was, what else can you do? I mean, you know, so that's the very nature of the work. And so um, I think international security, the Journal of International Security has been more open to qualitative studies uh, than, than, than some others. And so, but, but you have to get lucky. I, I'm not going to imagine that, that you don't, you you, that you have to dodge the machine gun bullets and, and, and hope that your samurai sword is faster than the bullets in order to, uh, to, to, to do this. Uh, on the kitchen sink part of this, uh, I think there's an incredible backlash on the kitchen sink approach. And so I'm actually pessimistic that the kitchen sink approach is, is viable. And I think that goes back to my first point about people being doubtful about these cross-country regression analyses where you essentially have this, this kitchen sink. There was a famous paper in the American Economic Review in uh, 1984 by a guy named Edward Lemer. And I think that was the first attack on the kitchen sink approach. Uh, it was on what he was calling extreme bounds analysis. And he was arguing that what had happened in the social sciences is that people were essentially using sort of um, too many variables that aren't in models that weren't well enough specified and the results as a result were pretty fragile. So I think the kitchen sink approach is probably um, very much, very much weakened. Um, result, you know, examples on successful policy research that's been very innovative that uh, has managed to, to get published recently. There's a nice paper uh, by Nate Jensen and co-authors in the American Journal of Political Science recently. Um, I'm not sure how they got past the international, uh, got their, past their, their, their um, IRB Institutional Review Board, but they created a false company. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not advocating deception as a strategy, but they did it. They created a false company. Uh, they then uh, asked government officials nationwide for tax exemption, tax you know, credits. And they sort of were able to look at the timing of elections. And essentially they, they sort of were able to look you know, at an important policy question, which is, is there a political election cycle associated with um, grants to, to multinational companies and by creating this sort of false set of companies, they were able to sort of say, yeah, that, that, sort, of, that sort of did happen. Uh, Michael Finley's work that I was going to show you, except my slides, I, I apologize. I guess my slides weren't showing all the way through. Sorry about that. I don't, I, uh, but one of the, th the things I was gonna show you was sort of a, a, another example by Michael Finley of setting up uh, multinational companies trying to then engage in tax fraud and tax evasion. So I, I think that the, the experimental revolution um, is working, but coming back to Haley's point, it's extremely expensive. And so those of us that don't have these kinds of resources then have to be doing very clever work that, that in some sense um, uh, um, tries to find unique situations and unique space where you can, can do this, this work. I, I, Rachel Wellhausen at the University of Texas, for instance, is studying elements of the international system by looking at banking in American Native Indian reservations. I could go through the details of this, but she's found this unusual space to study some important elements of, of uh, international relations. But there's no doubt uh, it's, it's, it's expensive 
and really very challenging. But, you know, I, I want to end on a, a sort of a, a positive note because there's a, you know, we, there's so much about this, this changed international system that we don't know. One way to think about this is that we thought in the 1950s to 1989 that we understood the political physics of the international system extremely well. It was stable, it was bipolar, you know, it had a hegemon, you know, we, we sort of knew the properties of this international system. And of course it collapsed and then we didn't know the properties. Well, we're kind of in that same moment where uh, I hope this isn't true, but it could be that the United States is exiting as a leader in the international system. Um, I'll show my politics. I'm, I'm, I'm not planning on voting for Donald Trump in 2024. Uh, but, but again, you know, there are forces that work in the United States that, that are moving against the center. And again, this creates extraordinary opportunity for us to be, again, thinking about multipolar worlds, to be thinking about, well, you know, what, what role does Korea have in Taiwan? And what, you know, what, what role, I mean, is, I realize relations between Korea and Japan are not, um, not wonderful at the moment, but nonetheless, China is quite a threat in this, in this, in this space. And so how, how do you in this space begin to think about the policy linkages between, you know, uh, you know, in light of this, that. so it's it's a very interesting time, but it's it's a very challenging time. I'm, um, but it does help to have resources to do these these studies, absolutely. Uh, and you know, uh, and I'm, you're completely right. There are fads and fashions, and sometimes you win on them, sometimes you lose on them. One thing, if I'm a graduate student, uh, I would be going to every conference I could possibly be going to, or in Zoom, I would be attending the Zoom conferences. Because in political science right at the moment, there are about 300, 400 people who define the field. They sort of set the, the intellectual agenda. They're the ones who sort of say, ah, this is hot now, this isn't hot later. Um, you know, couple of them are at the University of Virginia. David LeBlanc is at the University of Virginia. You know, Ken Sheavey is at Yale. So, you know, there are these, uh, Francis Rosenbluth is, is at Yale. Uh, I.O. Um, is edited at Georgetown. You know, there, so Eric Vooten is there. So there are these, these people that sort of set the agenda. Uh, I.O. is about to be edited at Princeton by Lena Mosley. Um, so, you know, they, they sort of set the agenda and going to conferences is where you really figure out where, where the frontier of the field is and who's setting the agenda. So a great set of questions. Great, a very, you know, makes me want to go back to graduate school, start all over again. Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm actually impressed by your old coverage uh, of the all the nine questions and with the some analytic edge and, and very instrumental. Uh, the response, to, especially for the uh, graduate students uh, here uh, on the Zoom. So now I want to open uh, the discussion for the floor here. So I, I think the end is there are several graduate students uh, right now with us. So, uh, so anyone who want to ask your desperate uh, questions uh, for, for example, how how we can pub, uh, publish uh, your own work or the uh, other any kind of concerns uh, which is related to the graded student's life, uh, then do not hesitate to ask uh, your desperate question for uh, uh, the Dennis. This is this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, when I was graduate students in in Seoul. There's no such a thing like this. So please exploit this kind of the opportunity here. Okay, so uh, I think the Sanghyun and Jonghyun, uh, in that order, you can ask the question to Dennis here. Okay. So um, th thanks for Professor Queen. I really enjoyed it, your talk as a graduate student who are like desperately suffering for the studying right now. <laughs> So like a brief introduction for myself. So uh, my research interest is actually about the relationship between technology and the statecraft um, and its, its impact on the international relations, which is um, closely related to the policy studies as well. 
And um, um, during your talk, your talk, your point on the political backlash and the international system reminds me of my research agenda on emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence or like quantum computing, and also my following question. So, uh, given the like recent trend of emerging technology, I think as you all know that I gained the sense that the sector in technologies. Is actually not lies in like single disciplinary approach, but intersects the field of IPE or security, or international organ organizations, or like even international business. So, um, I want to hear your thoughts on um, how the field of international international relations can include this kind of um, new and high technologies, given this like complexity, and also how could we as a as a dreaming to be a scholar in international relations approach this, this kind of a technology sector? That's my question. Okay, thank you. And first, let, let me have another question and then uh, I will turn to Dennis here. So, Jonghyun. Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Quinn for the, uh, giving us wonderful ideas about how to do a research if we are going to uh, do a PhDs in the next decades. So um, I'm currently writing a thesis uh, uh, under Professor Haley Lee. And I originally had one question. It was about like, uh, I know that micro foundations are important in terms of research subjects, but when we think of globalization backlash, we do not just see the preference of Individual individuals are cleanly organized to solely redistributive reasons, uh, what we saw in the past two decades. Rather, individuals' preference might uh, lie solely to leaders' image, or they might just cheerlead their party without considering particular issues. So regarding these reasons or issues, I know that uh, exper experimental designs are important to figuring this puzzle uh, because we are uh, researching individuals' preference. But in terms of sub uh, research interests, what do you think about like prospect of integrative research uh, of political psychology on IPEs uh, to figure this puzzle out? Uh, this was my original questions, but when we when I heard uh, your speech, like I I feel like I felt like I need to do another questions because I feel like methods are leading the questions. When I heard that, uh, uh, like, uh, sorry, like I heard that new theory, new data, new methods, new results, and a hot topic maybe, uh, these leads to top journals. When I heard this, I felt like methods are leading to questions because like experimental designs are use useful to finding more than just correlations of regressional type of research but I think it restricts the subjects of research. Uh, what Professor Haley Lee uh, said earlier, this type of research is hard to apply uh, in cross-national type of research. But if experimental risk designs are hot, we need to do this. Is there another way we could like go to the top journals, find uh, more micro foundational de details or causal relations between X and Y without regarding experimental designs. For example, adding regressional type of research with a uh, qualitative type of research. I think this might uh, still uh, like, uh, find, this might still uh, really be important to finding causal relations, uh, but why why are you em emphasizing uh, experimental designs in terms of uh, in, in terms of this right well let me like, I, so let me take them in, in uh, the order presented let me start with technology and ai so i do think back to the ephemeral what's hot at the moment that's really hot and uh, let me talk about three ways I, I see it as being really hot. One is actually just straight up in the regulatory space. So I'm seeing a lot of very interesting projects where people are trying to think through how do you regulate these big firms or um, in particular, 
uh, I've come across a couple of very interesting papers on whether or not algorithms are actually amplifying, back to political psychology, polarization. So, um, it, you know, I, you know, if you can find an interesting international relations application, then I think it's absolutely, uh, uh, you know, one, I'm not a security person, but I think one of the most interesting set of questions that's out in front of us is going to be what will war look like in years to come with essentially uh, military applications overwhelmingly using uh, AI technology. I mean, uh, the United States had some pretty terrible outcomes in Afghanistan trying to use advanced um, AI methods and, you know, taking out whole families and taking out whole villages. I mean, so, you know, <clears throat> but anyway, I, I think technology and AI, uh, both on the security side and on the IPE side is, is um, very important. So, you know, that's interesting about the, the political psychology. I'm, I'm myself extremely interested in political psychology. I didn't answer one of Haley's comments, uh, which was about the, the difference in protection and redistribution, partly because I wanted to leave time. But, you know, political psychology actually has a lot to tell us because it does appear that from the political psychology studies that people don't like to experience themselves as the beneficiaries of redistribution, but they're very willing to be the beneficiaries of protection. So I, I don't want to receive cash, but I'd be very happy to have you block Chinese exports from my, my tire factory. And that appears to be sort of a pretty deeply rooted human reaction that, that transcends. So, I, you know, political psychology is, is, is really very important. And, you know, I, I do think that you can do some interesting experimental studies in political psychology uh, on international relations that might not be that expensive and that, that would help help the cause. And in particular, if you look at one of the gripe uh, you know, papers that was presented, it was by Ken Sheedy and Mikhail Bechtel and a lady from Stanford who was one of Ken's doctoral students. It was a series of survey experiments seeking to uncover the psychological foundations of cooperation on climate change. What were people willing to do? So I think there's a lot of very important work to be done in the psychology, social, the political psychology of, of global cooperation. So I would not in the least bit give up any, any hope on that. I, and I certainly wouldn't change. Um, but you know, um, it, it nonetheless is the case that there's a causal identification revolution that is out there, and you know Ken, who's just a just a fabulous scholar, had a very important paper. I won't go through the details, uh, but you know, four or five years, he just couldn't land this paper. Finally, ended up landing in comparative political studies, and so you know, even the very elite scholars just sometimes have to be extremely stubborn and just have to stick with it and you know, be the last samurai and keep, keep after, after, after their work. I think I've got another talk at eight o'clock. So maybe five more minutes. Yes, we have, we have just five minutes to go here. So uh, I think the Tessa, do you have any questions to Dennis here? Uh, first of all, thank you for really a uh, helpful and excellent talk. I, I am also a student and professor at Liddy. Uh, I wanted to listen to your recommendation of following the causal identif identification discourse in economics for young political science scholars. And regarding the research trend, I am currently studying the Bangladesh of local firms in developing countries. So I wanted to ask that, do you think that the Bangladesh of developing countries also get the scholars focus as the Bangladesh of US or EU countries? Thank you. That's a very important question. And the short answer seems to be the backlash has a different important feature. And I haven't seen anybody really address that question quite as cleanly. So for instance, in Vietnam, where wages are soaring, you know, 
So Nike has all these factories. Most of the factories are actually owned by Korean firms that have contracts with Nike. Wages have gone up like that. But the backlash is actually on things like environmental uh, degradation and labor rights. And so the backlash just has a different form. Um, and it, 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 so, and I think that's a very important set of questions. So the, the, the people who are quote unquote, the losers of globalization in emerging markets, well, what it means to lose is different from what it means to lose in the advanced economies. In the advanced economies, it essentially is a wage loss or a, an employment security loss. And in emerging markets, it tends Bangladesh, for instance, to be rooted instead in atrocious working conditions or in other kinds of environmental degradation. And so I, I think that's a really interesting set of questions and I would very much recommend pursuing it. I, I, I haven't seen people do anywhere near enough work on that. In fact, here's a puzzle for you. New Delhi has the world's worst air. So just, just appalling. I was in New Delhi a couple years ago and I thought it was a joke, but no, it's, it's, I grew up in Pittsburgh in the, in the steel coal industry. I thought I knew what bad air was like. No, New Delhi's worse, but there's no riots in the street. I mean, there's no, I mean, so, you know, what, what is it that, that causes backlash in some sites, but not in others? And so I think that's an extremely interesting question that you're, that you're asking. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, now almost time's up. So uh, I want to assign just uh, one minute for our discussants. Uh, each. So Haley, uh, if you have any overall comments on this session, then just, just wrap up your idea in, in just one minute and the, uh, the same thing for Inhan. Okay, so Haley. Yeah, so um, just, I wanted to thank you. Um, I want to thank, I wanted to thank Dennis for um, sharing a great talk with us and also, you know, answering like a numerous questions that we had and also addressing questions by graduate students. Um, yeah, and yeah, I'm happy that we had this full session to share our insight with grad students. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, thank you very much. So Inhan? Uh, thank you, Dennis, for your enlightening and inspiring uh, presentation today. And I'm, uh, I was happy uh, that you uh, mentioned a lot of last summer, I think, uh, uh, through your the other Q&A sessions. Uh, and graduate students here, if you haven't watched it, uh, I recommend to watch it over Netflix or whatever, and you will feel, you will see what I mean, uh, doing qualitative things <laughs> um, through the movie. Okay. Um, yeah, and the, um, I'm pretty sure that one thing that I just wanted to say to the undergraduate students, um, this is one uh, wisdom I learned uh, through my graduate training and back in the States many years ago. Uh, my uh, advisor, John Owen, uh, told me uh, that, hey, Inan, uh, when I was struggling to find out my yeah, methodology and research topic, what he said was, Inan, don't be afraid of methodology stuff. Uh, methodology is a function of your research question. Um, and if you have a good research question, and if you feel that that's one you want to dig in, just go and dig in. Um, so be brave. That's what I did in the land. Uh, when the um, uh, Professor Kim said uh, somebody kind of desperate about your research thing, yeah, that's me. But still, <laughs> um, I'm here, and you know, I'm just trying to learn something from Dennis, and it was really useful and insightful the you know, uh, presentation. I'm happy to be part of this. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So, uh, Dennis, do you have any concluding remarks? I, because I, I know you, you're going to have another round of the keynote speech in a moment. So, well, no, it's just very nice to be with you. Great questions, great comments. Uh, I hope I, I've yet to get to Korea, but I hope I will someday. And I hope I'll see some of you there at that time. So, very nice to be with you all. Okay, great. So uh, for, for, the, for your information, so uh, Dennis will have another round of the keynote address and which will be live uh, broadcasting to, through the YouTube here. So uh, please, please uh, have your 
uh, time uh, with this the important uh, another events uh, with the Dennis here. Okay, thank you very much. This is a really wonderful and productive session, especially for the graduate students and the future generation of the scholars in international relations. Thank you very much, and uh, hopefully see you again, hopefully in person in the future. Okay, thank you. I could Haley, could you stay on one second? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Well, okay. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tan. Very nice to be with you folks from Washington, DC. I am very sorry not to be in Seoul, South Korea with you. What I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the US position in the world order. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be somewhat pessimistic about what the next 10 or so years will look like from the perspective of the US and its integration in the, in the world order. So what I'll do is I'll talk through, I think one of the central dilemmas facing the, the world order and then talk a little bit about US domestic politics and why I think the United States will perhaps not be as reliable, I'm sorry to say, a partner as I, I would hope would be. Let me begin by talking a little bit about the international system and the overarching nature of um, the US role. So I think as everyone will know from the 1940s to the 1980s, uh, the US had a very central role in international relations where in some ways we had a relatively stable world order uh, there was an ongoing threat of nuclear war, but we had a bipolar system and the United States was a key anchor in the context of the competition with, with uh, the Soviet Union. Of course, with the collapse of the communist order and in particular with China's deep economic reforms, we end up in a post-communist world order. And this post-communist world order was a, an odd order because in some ways, what we thought we knew about the international system, its stability, its um, bipolarity, it, uh, sort of collapsed very, very quickly. And what replaced it as it, it, the, the approach that scholars ended up adopting was essentially a focus on the spread of democracy and globalization. Uh, we ended up as a group of scholars imagining, for instance, that as China increasingly integrated in the world economy, there would be a greater emphasis on its cooperation, uh, uh, potentially increasing uh, political openness to match its economic openness. I think it's fair to say that this generation's core research problems are rooted instead in some disappointments from the, 1920, the, the 1990s and the 2000s. In fact, uh, China, as it has emerged as a major dominant power, has not only not begun a political liberalization, but in some ways appears to have reversed. Uh, it's become a, a, a more uh, significant political threat in the, in the region. Uh, in some ways, the success of globalization in the 1990s and in the 2000s has created a backlash to globalization and it's a backlash to democracy and indeed a, a backlash to the US dominated global order. What I'd like to do is spend a few minutes just focusing on why in particular there's this backlash in the United States and what this I think might mean to East Asia and to the national security system in East Asia. My view is that right at the moment, thanks to widespread economic liberalization in the 1990s and 2000s. There are about 5,000 or so global firms that have come to dominate the global system. Uh, these companies are enormous, very powerful. Uh, in the United States, for instance, about 1,000 firms account for about more than 50% of our exports. Recent data on Korea suggests that about a little more than 1%, a little less than 1% of Korean firms end up uh, being responsible for about 66 or so percent of, of Korean exports. The dominance of these large firms is predicated on their ability to move resources very quickly across space and time. And in particular, what you've seen in places like the United States is that you've had a hollowing out of manufacturing in the United States and other kinds of services. 
as US firms have moved increasingly overseas to capture advantage. Uh, in some work I've done with one of my colleagues at Georgetown, Li Zhu Lu, uh, we were able to look at the universe of Chinese exports between 2000 and 2007, tag the firms that were doing the exports and discover that in fact, the majority of Chinese exports to the United States were actually done by foreign multinationals, not by indigenous Chinese firms. So what that essentially has meant in the United States and in other places is that there's been this systematic movement of resources out of the United States into the global economy, which essentially has led to growth in these other economies. So that clearly is a beneficial and good thing. But it's led to a weakening inside the United States of the broad support for globalization. In fact, I think the, the core argument that I'm making is that the system of international capitalism that emerged in the collapse of communism essentially has created political contradictions such that its very success um, economically is undermining the political foundations of the, the, of the order. Let me give you a couple of very concrete examples. So in the United States, wages for people with a college degree or less have been stagnating, have stagnated since the 1970s. It's not a surprise that that's happened because as other economies have integrated, what US and other firms have attempted to do is move resources out of the United States where wages are relatively high into countries where for relatively similar levels of productivity, they can pay much fewer wages, much lower wages. This is a good deal, of course, for the companies, but what this has done in the United States is create this antipathy and hostility toward globalization. Um, and this antipathy toward globalization manifests itself not simply in terms of the lack of support for trade, but increasingly a lack of support for US global engagement. <clears throat> so that the, the people inside the United States are increasingly equating our economic integration with our political integration and our military alliances. In some sense, our ability as an international system to solve collective action problems, the, the security environmental challenges that we face, is kind of predicated on the efficacy of governments to be able to coordinate and solve problems. But in part because of this sort of international capitalist system, A, the capacity of governments to cooperate with each other is increasingly undermined. And secondarily, the political support within countries, particularly like the United States, for this global cooperation has diminished. The net result of this has been that at least in the, with regard to the United States as an anchor economy, there is increasingly diminished support in the United States for our role as an international guarantor. Partly what has happened is US workers had come to expect the quality of life that they experienced in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and even in the 1990s as sort of the, the natural lifestyle, but that as the global economy integrated, as people began to find themselves in competition more globally, they began to reject the global system itself. Uh, President Trump, perhaps more than any political entrepreneur in the last 20 or so years, was able to sort of experiment with themes that essentially challenged the U.S. role in the international system and was able to persuade a large number of workers that and, and citizens that the U.S. engagement globally was, in fact, not um, advantageous to the United States. So I think the bottom line of US politics at the moment is that our international exposure to trade and finance, particularly from US-based multinationals, is strongly associated with the backlash in the US to the international system. Um, let me just pessimistically note that if former President Trump runs 
he, he thinks he, he's saying that he might, and wins in uh, 2024, we will likely observe a further retreat by the United States from leadership in the international system. So one of the challenges that I think confronts people in East Asia and more generally is, what does a, an international security system look like if the United States is not able to take or is not willing to take an important leading role? Let me note two recent events from this last week that I think highlight some of the complexity of whether the United States will end up playing a lead role in the global economy and in the global security system. The state of Georgia was uh, one of the places that President Biden was able to win well, in, in this last election. It was a very closely fought state. It was won very narrowly by a few thousand votes, uh, uh, maybe 12,000 or so votes. The governor of Georgia is a Republican named uh, Governor Kemp. He's a person who followed the law and asserted correctly that President Biden won the election. He's being challenged inside the Republican Party by former Senator David Perdue uh, for the governorship. And Donald Trump is supporting uh, former Senator Perdue in the Republican primary against Governor Kemp. This may seem like a narrow and idiosyncratic thing, and what does this have to do with the international system? But what I think this has to do with the international system is that Inside the United States, there's a challenge to the constitutional order. And this con challenge to the constitutional order is being led by former President Trump and some of his supporters, such that those Republicans who supported the constitutional order and the general rule of law are often being challenged electorally in their own system. So in the event that, that Governor Kemp, who had a very, very conservative Republican, ends up losing in Georgia to former Senator Perdue. There'll be a message sent to Republicans more generally that those who support the, the constitutional order in the United States run the risk of being ousted politically. So in some big picture sense, in, inside the United States, there's a direct challenge to our ability to maintain and defend our commitments. There was also a moment in this week where President Biden and the U.S. administration had a note to Iran in the context of the security negotiations about the Iran nuclear disarmament. Iran, of course, is looking for a binding commitment from the United States. And President Biden correctly, I unfor if unfortunately, noted that at the moment he's unable to offer a commitment in terms of binding the hands of future presidents. So as we look out at the challenges, whether it's uh, President Putin looking covetously at the Ukraine or um, uh, China's increasing expansion, I'm worried as a, as, a, as a US citizen, as well as a scholar of international relations, that the weakening of the United States is posing an important and very significant threat, long run threat to the stability of the international order. I wish I weren't bringing pessimistic news, but that, that's my, my deep concern as I look forward over uh, this, this period. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give the keynote speech uh, at the KAIS conference this year. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you physically uh, this year because of the pandemic, uh, and so I send my apologies for that. Uh, I would like to start by saying that I was very much looking forward to coming to Korea this year because, uh, as I told Professor Wong earlier, 41 years ago, I was a student at Yonsei University for about a year. And I have not been back to Korea for 41 years. So uh, unfortunately, I can't be there with you physically today, but I, I very much uh, am with you in spirit. Uh, I've been asked to make a few comments about the future of political science. Uh, I must say that you know, as president of political, the Polit American Political Science Association, I've been thinking about this long and hard as to where we are going as a discipline. 
I must also say that I've been a longtime member and active in the International Studies Association. So I think of political science and international studies as being intimately connected. Let me start with a few disclaimers before I begin. First, my comments today in no way reflect the editorial policy of the American Political Science Review. I was the editor for uh, from 2012 to 2016, nor the views of the APSA, of which I'm currently president. Um, my thoughts are, are my own. Second, my comments really are limited to my experience with American political science. And the example I use are based upon those experiences, although I think these themes resonate beyond the United States. Uh, third, I should warn you that uh, unlike what I tell my students, I commit every known mistake in PowerPoint presentations. There are too much text, no animation, all black and white, and sometimes I read off the slides, as I am doing today. Also, I'm not sure I can answer the question posed in the title. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball to be able to predict the future, nor any ability at all to point predict what the future holds for our discipline. But I can talk about what I see as general trends and prospects uh, for our field. A little bit about myself, it shapes how I see things. Uh, for 18 years, I was at primarily a teaching institution at Truman State University in uh, Missouri. Uh, for the last 13 years, I've been at a primarily research intensive university that grants PhDs in political science, uh, the University of North Texas. For nine years, I was the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Political Science Education, which is now currently one of the journals offered by the APSA. From 2012 to 2016, I was editor-in-chief of the American Political Science Review. In 2021, I was elected president-elect of the APSA, and currently I am serving as the president of the American Political Science Association. So that, that's a little bit about myself. It has sort of shaped how I view uh, the, uh, the discipline because I've experienced many aspects of it. Today, I wanna to talk about uh, challenges facing our discipline, some trends that I've observed, and what might be done or what might be expected for the future. Now, uh, you're probably not aware of this, but you know, American political science has been under, uh, uh, under attack in many ways, uh, especially uh, in terms of the National Science Foundation. Uh, in 2013, there was an amendment passed to the budget that called for the defunding of the political science section of the American National Science Foundation and called for the elimination of political science except for research projects that the director of the National Science Foundation certifies as promoting national security or the economic interests of the United States. This was removed in the 2014 authorization bill, but an important threshold had been passed. It put the reorganization of political science on the agenda for the National Science Foundation. Uh, since 2019, there has been a reorganization of the NSF to effectively reflect the priorities of the Coburn Amendment. Gone is a director of the political science section of the National Science Foundation to be replaced by two separate directorates, one that focuses on national security and the other that focuses on economic interests. This brings up some very hard questions about where we are going towards as a discipline. And I think the changes in the NSF reflect those kinds of changes facing us in the future. So how does this happen? Well, the basic crux of the critique of political science in the United States is that we are not relevant, that commentators at major news networks like CNN can tell the public more about politics than any of us can. Uh, although we can criticize that claim, there is some merit to this. At least in the United States, when expert commentary is asked for on some burning political issue, it is more often the case that a journalist will be asked for their insight than a political scientist. And why is that? Frankly, because not many people and some quite intelligent people can figure, can figure out what we are really saying. We have trouble communicating our field. This must change. And I have long argued that the profession's leading journals should lead this change. Now, what trends do I see uh, in our field uh, over, the, over the past years? Well, it's not a collectively exhaustive list, but first there is a growing internationalization of the discipline. Uh, the internationalization of the discipline means that what happens in the rest of the world affects American politics, and American politics affects what happens in much of the rest of the world. 
uh, the new generation of political scientists must understand the globally interconnected nature of our field. Uh, in fact, I would argue that as a result of the internationalization of the discipline, there has been a decline of American politics as a field, or at least its rebirth as a comparative or part of comparative politics. Uh, there's a growing sense that the solutions to America's problems lies in understanding the political processes in other countries. And uh, I think this is something that we're going to be increasingly seeing in our discipline. Now, having said that, I also noticed since the, the Trump administration, there's a growing sense of the importance of certain aspects of American politics that are growing in popularity, particularly the study of immigration and race and ethnic politics, as well as identity politics. Second, uh, in international relations, there has been the decline of the study of international conflict. Uh, as, as some perhaps mistakenly point out, uh, they argue that the world is growing more peaceful because there are fewer international wars. Uh, however, I would argue that the shift of conflict has not uh, is simply moved from the realm of international conflict to non-state conflict and civil wars. This would require then a greater connection between traditionally international relations scholars and comparative politics scholars. Uh, in many ways, the two fields are meeting in terms of understanding the processes of conflict generally, not just international conflict. In terms of theory, uh, there is a move away from the study of only the political theory of the ancients, it's sort of propagated by the Straussian school, and effectively studying what uh, I think many in, my, uh, in the United States refer to derogatorily as dead white guys. Uh, there's much more emphasis on contemporary theory, much greater interest in non-Western theory, and importantly, how a Western theory impacts non-Western theory, and much more emphasis on applied theory. What does all this make in terms of a difference in the lives of people? There is, as Dave Leighton has pointed out for some time now, a growing unity of methodological approaches. The formal the normative, the quantitative, and the qualitative have grown closer together. Although we still have our methodological debates, we still have the divisions that exist in epistemology. But however, as Leighton points out, and I, I clearly see this, that new strands of research are emphasizing formal, normative, quantitative, and qualitative methodologies. The expectation that a good piece is not solely, and it's not solely be formal, for instance. For example, as editor, we had a shift away, and I think this is continuing, that there were pieces published in the APSR that were merely formal proofs. Uh, that is long gone. Even formal models now require some degree of evidence to demonstrate that what is proposed actually works in the real world. Or the combination more recently of formal and normative theory, which is, in my view, quite exciting. Fifth, there is a growing importance of studying diversity and the impact of an increasingly multicultural West. Six, the importance, in my view, of the study of teaching and student learning. There has been a great emphasis in the American Political Science Association in the importance of transmitting knowledge to our students, both at the graduate level and the undergraduate level. Uh, there's also great concern that uh, the population of our country knows very little about civics, about politics, and how to engage politically. There is a poll call for uh, us to improve our instruction of civic engagement and civic education. I, I like to you know, share briefly that you know, recent polls indicate that the vast majority of Americans do not know that there are three branches of government in the United States. Less than a third can identify even uh, identify two of the three branches. Uh, there is simply very little civic education or understanding of politics in this country, and it is incumbent upon us as political scientists to address that challenge. And uh, so, what might be done? I think there's a need to return what I think so many scholars have said before that it is important that we become relevant. Now, what does relevance mean? Well, relevance, to become relevant, we might have to focus, we have focused uh, over the 
past decades, a great deal on methodological trivia and gigantic theoretical questions. Now, I am myself quantitative and I understand the importance of methodological training, but that often leaves little in the way of under, little of poly, policy relevance and not, it's not easily understandable, intelligent, but not expert readers. Uh, I was speaking to David Lake, a good friend of mine at University of, University of California, San Diego, about how our graduate programs train graduate students, that there's such a great em emphasis on training and methodology that by the time they have to choose a research question to write a dissertation, they'll say something like, well, I like to do a survey experiment. But a survey experiment is not a dissertation topic. It is a method. And pro the problem has been we have focused so much on method that students know little about substance. It is no wonder that we have lost our audience and that we need to get it back. Everyone talks about relevance these days, about policy relevance, but how do we do that? Well, an important role needs to be played by the discipline's leading journals. We need to publish pieces that people will read beyond political scientists. We need, work with our, we need to work with our publishers to be more active in engaging the news media and at the public at large. And I know the Cambridge University Press does this for the American Political Science Review and has continued to do so after I stepped down as editor-in-chief. Editor and, and I think that this is going to be an increasing trend to emphasize what we do and its relevance to the public at large. We need to provide exposure to pieces that are fundamentally important to foster public intellect and intellectual debate. Uh, not simply because they're methodologically sophisticated, but because they uh, address interesting questions that will foster debate. That, in my view, is a mark of quality. I think we need to stop being afraid of politics. In a piece some years ago in a newsletter called Inside Higher Education, several of those interviewed uh, said we are essentially afraid to engage in politics. There's nothing wrong with political scientists engaging in public debate on topical issues. And, you know, I think as political scientists, we are probably best prepared to engage in politics in an informed way. And as a discipline, we need to focus on teaching again. We do face a crisis in the West where our population knows little or nothing about democracy and how it works. I might add that today, the White House in the United States is conducting a summit for democracy, where one of the principal themes is the lack of civic education across the globe. What we do best is acquiring basic knowledge. What makes us most relevant is imparting that knowledge and where we have the greatest impact and the greatest relevance on a daily basis, as far as I'm concerned, is via teaching. We re need to focus on teaching now more than ever because there is a great need to re-engage citizens in the democratic process. Politicians may not like our discipline, but they do realize the lack of civic engagement in politics is a problem of national, if not international, significance. Promoting civic engagement and civic education has a widespread global support, but we have not, as a discipline, embraced this as a scholarly activity. But I would say that this is changing. A recent book by Elizabeth Motto, Alison McCartney, Elizabeth Benyon, and Richard Simpson on, has focused on teaching civic engagement globally. This is published by the American Political Science Association and emphasizes our role in promoting civic engagement across the globe. Uh, there is a new world of technology which we are only beginning to understand what works and what does not in terms of pedagogy in an online environment. And further, in this era of assessment and accountability of higher education, where politicians scrutinize what we do, and which has widespread public support, we need to do a much better job of showing how what we do in the classroom actually leads to student learning. It is simply what we are supposed to do, to be both a teacher and a scholar, in my view. Not that good research becomes great teachers, they usually don't. They're very different skill sets. But in my view, if you only do research and cannot teach, what is the point? If you teach and do not do research, what is then, which is how we learn, then what exactly is it that you are teaching? The two have to go together as hand and glove. Gone are the days, I think, where you can be one or the others. So what is the future? In the short run, 
we certainly will have to prepare for post-COVID era. And I might point out that the 2022 APSA convention in Montreal, Canada's focus is on towards a post-COVID political science. Uh, I, I would encourage all of you to submit a proposal to the conference. Uh, the call is open now. Uh, and I hope to see you in Montreal. Uh, we must be much better about connecting our scholarship with practice and teaching. In the long run, I think the face of the discipline, particularly in the United States, will change. More scholarship is based on international and comparative perspectives, which can be justified in terms of national security and economic interests. More effort will be designed to connect with a broader array audience, and there will be more effort needed on justifying our existence and being more active in defending our discipline. Ultimately, I do not know what the future will be like for this discipline I love. It will be difficult. A threshold has been crossed and we have to be prepared for a rather uncertain future. In times of political and economic insecurity, greater cultural and ethnic diversity, rising potential for conflict, and less and not less knowledge in the political sphere, in my view, the world needs what we have to offer more than ever before. Uh, my colleague and predecessor, Jan Bach Steffensmeyer, talks about the next century as being the century of political science, because there will be a great need for what we can offer. It will be a future, however, that we make or you make as the next generation of political scientists. And thank you very much. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, okay. Welcome to this panel. Uh, this panel is a part of uh, the Korean Association of International Studies Association uh, annual conferences. And this panel's title is uh, Review Process of Major Political Science Journals and Writing Strategies. So as a, the panel title uh, implies, uh, we will today discuss about uh, how to publish our papers on top journals uh, in political science. Uh, so for that uh, purpose in mind, we have invited uh, 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 prestigious scholars in political science and international relations. And uh, this panel is going to uh, uh, proceed as follows. Uh, I will introduce uh, the main uh, presenter and then I'll uh, introduce the two designated discussants as well. And then after uh, main presenters uh, uh, presentation, presentation, we will have uh, two discussants uh, uh, sharing their thoughts about the st uh, publication strategies and, and publication situations. And then we will open the floor if, uh, if we can, and then we'll share some uh, question and answer uh, time as well. Okay, so uh, I'm a moderator for this panel, and my name is uh, Seo jung a professor of uh, political science at Gyeonggi University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, let me just uh, introduce uh, our main presenter today. Uh, John Ishiyama uh, is our main presenter, and he is currently uh, the University Distinguished Research Professor of Political Science Department of Political Science at the University of uh, North Texas. And he's also, uh, since the 2000, uh, 2020, uh, president-elect American Political Science Association. So if you don't mind, please explain to us about uh, the, your uh, starting time and ending time as, as the president of APSA, because it sounds like uh, APSA and KPSA have a little bit different uh, yeah. uh, schedules in terms of the administration. Mm -hmm. And he uh, also was uh, from 2012 to, uh, through 2016, lead editor and editor in chief of American Political Science Review. So I think uh, this experience of John uh, has a great relevance uh, for this panel today. And I'm just looking through his uh, uh, CV and uh, 
uh, tons of pages, actually, his CV. Uh, he uh, got his PhD from uh, Michigan State University, Department of Political Science in 1992. And he got a master's program in 1985 from University of Michigan, a center for Russian and East European studies. And he uh, studied as an undergraduate at Bowling Green State University, Department of Political Science and Department of History. And I heard that Bowling Green is, is located in Ohio. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And he has many, 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 many publications, uh, no doubt. Uh, eight books and 149 articles. Uh, hopefully we can get there <laughs> in some future, uh, but it's a great achievement. And his books include uh, in 2018, From Bullets to Ballots, The Transformation of Rebel Groups into Political Parties, uh, published by uh, Routledge. And his uh, articles include uh, uh, Born to Run, Where Rebel Parties Participate in Post-Conflict Local Elections, a Journal of Elections and Public Opinion and Parties. So uh, this is the uh, short and brief introduction of John Ishiyama. And if you don't mind, let me just go to our two discussants and their introduction as well. Uh, Professor Wu Biao Wan, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> Wu Biao Wan uh, at Yonsei University. He is an associate professor since uh, 2019. He is also associate dean of College of Social Sciences. Uh, he was Deputy Director of Institute of East and West Studies from 2020 uh, through 2021. And he got his PhD from the Ohio State University, uh, Columbus, Ohio, in uh, 2010. His dissertation title is The Strategic Politics of IMF Con Conditionality. And he got his BA uh, uh, undergraduate degree from Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea political science and diplomacy uh, in 2003. He also has uh, many articles published in top journals in political science, including uh, the forthcoming uh, Curse of Friendship, IMF Program Friendship with the United States and Foreign uh, Direct Investment published by the World Economy. This is forthcoming. And for our panel uh, relevance, he uh, served, he has served as a reviewer for many top journals, including AJPS, APSR, BJPS, and Culture and Politics, Economics and Politics, and so on. Uh, so welcome uh, to this panel, Professor Wu. And then our, uh, uh, the other, uh, Discussant, Professor Kim Nam Gyu. Hello. Uh, he is currently an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations in, uh, at Korea University. He was associate professor at Song Kyung Kwan University as well. And he's, he got his PhD from uh, University of Michigan uh, in political science in 2012. He uh, has an uh, undergraduate degree in a very interesting field, business administration uh, in, uh, at Seoul National University in 2003. Uh, Professor Kim Nam Gyu also has many, many uh, articles published by top journals in political science, including foreign direct investment and uh, democratic survival in democratization, which is also forthcoming. And he also uh, has served as reviewers for prestigious journals in political science and IR, including AJPS, American Political Science Review, Asian Survey, British Journal of Political Science, Compared to Political Studies, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm done with introducing our uh, prestigious uh, presenters and discussants. So let's uh, get uh, the business right away. Uh, we have a plenty of time, John. So you have uh, about uh, 15 minutes, uh, five zero minutes for oh. your presentation. And then our two discussants will have each 
15 minutes uh, for their uh, thought sharing. And then we'll open the floor and we'll get the, uh, some questions and answers uh, uh, moving forward. Okay, so uh, John, uh, it's your time, please. Okay, very good. I certainly won't be taking 50 minutes. Uh, I'll probably be much shorter than that. It, it should uh, provide an opportunity for people to uh, ask any questions they want at the end. That'll maximize uh, the uh, time for questions and answers. Let me set this up very quickly. Okay, uh, uh, this is a presentation I often make across uh, the world, actually. I've been invited to talk about the publishing process. Now, I, I want to start with saying that the title of this presentation, and I think it intersects with the title of the session, is called Getting Publishing. Not getting published, but getting publishing. In other words, understanding the publishing game. You know, what is it like behind the screen where the editors sit? You know, there is a, in the United States an old uh, movie called The Wizard of Oz. I'm not sure if uh, you know this in Korea, but in The Wizard of Oz, the Grand Wizard sits behind the screen, pulling all the levers and making things happen. And sometimes I think that scholars believe that editors of the major journals are like the Wizard of Oz, sort of manipulating things and making uh, certain that some things get published and other things don't. Uh, the truth is that's not the truth, that uh, what happens behind the screen is actually quite straightforward. And I think if you want to see how uh, to get published in a top journal, it would help to understand the process by which top journals operate. And I have to say that, you know, the talk is about common practices. Uh, and again, the processes and practices do vary across the journal. Uh, in fact, my experience has been with three journals. Uh, I, I had worked with International Politics, uh, the Journal of Political Science Education, of which I was editor in chief, and the APSR. Uh, so my experience is not broad uh, beyond those three journals, but I think it's broad enough to comment on how the common practices are for various journals in the discipline. Uh, this talk is not about uh, how to get published in the APSR. Uh, often I'm asked that, is that, well, how do I get published in the APSR? Well, this, this talk is not about that. Uh, and it's also not focused on book publishing. Uh, book publishing, as I'm sure most all of you know, is a very different kind of game as compared to getting published in a top journal. So I think of this as being understanding the game. It is rather a game uh, and understanding the rules of the game and to maximize your probability of success is to understand those processes and rules. Uh, generally, article publishing involves really three major processes. First is the submission process. Second is the review process. And third is the decision process. And then there's reject, revise, resubmit. I'll talk about those later. And then uh, beyond the decision process, if you're fortunate enough to be accepted, there is the production process. Okay, so a couple of things, and I'm sure most of you know this, but not all junior scholars know this. I have to tell this to my graduate students and my junior colleagues. Uh, you may submit to only one journal at a time. It is unethical to submit a manuscript to multiple journals simultaneously. Now, for those of us who are experienced scholars, this is second nature, we know this. But for newer scholars, this is somewhat new. They think that they can take a manuscript and submit it to multiple places and see who takes it first for publication. Now, in some ways, uh, book publishing is like that, although that, in, that industry is evolving. But for journals, you can only submit to one journal at a time. And in many ways, most journals will actually remind you of that commitment and uh, have you uh, check off a box that says, yes, I understand that this article that I'm submitting for your, you to review is only being currently reviewed by your journal. Okay. Now, submission beyond just uh, you know choosing the journal is uh, based upon nowadays web-based systems. Uh, and when I was publishing, and when some of you were uh, senior scholars were submitting manuscripts, often it was in the very old days we would submit hard copies. 
uh, when I was a young student. Uh, and when the first time I submitted a manuscript, I had to copy, make eight hard copies and send them to the journal. Okay. Uh, you might even find sometimes that journals still have that requirement of submitting hard copies. If they have that on their hub, uh, website, it's largely because they haven't updated their guidelines because no one requires hard copies anymore. Uh, occasionally journals will use email attachments for submissions. Some of the uh, uh, more specialized journals that have uh, a smaller staff often require email attachments, uh, although that's rapidly moving towards web-based systems like Editorial Manager or Scholar One. Often uh, the author can suggest upon submission potential reviewers, which by the way, for editors, this actually helps. Uh, I, I, as an editor of uh, the three journals that I was involved in, actually liked having authors suggest potential reviewers because, frankly, editors don't know everybody in the field. So uh, suggesting potential reviewers that can review your manuscript will help. With a cautionary, you should not be uh, recommending your spouse or your dissertation advisor or someone with whom you have a conflict of interest. Okay. Uh, but beyond that, feel free to suggest potential reviewers. You also have the opportunity to oppose certain reviewers who you do not want. Now, uh, rest assured, uh, or be aware that editors are not bound by this. In fact, if it depends, if you uh, oppose a reviewer and you say something like, I oppose this reviewer because this person works in the same field I do. Uh, that is not a reason to oppose a reviewer. In fact, by telling us that, editors are likely to choose that person. Uh, now, what is a legitimate opposition is when someone says, well, I oppose this reviewer because this, or I oppose this potential reviewer because this potential reviewer was a former spouse of mine and we've had a bad divorce. I've seen that. That's acceptable. Uh, but don't just oppose a reviewer just because they happen to be working in the same field as you. Now, what happens after you submit? Now, once it gets into the hands of the journal staff, uh, it's officially submitted and logged into a database, usually by the editorial assistant, uh, who could be a graduate student. It could be also a professional editorial assistant. The APSR now uses a professional editorial assistant or managing editor who is based in uh, the APSA central office. Uh, but some journals, they have their own staff, usually staffed by graduate students uh, who are then charged with uh, uh, use, taking the manuscript and logging in into a database. Once it's logged into a database, all manuscripts are technical checked. Now, all journals do this to some extent. Some are rather... Uh, uh, you know, draconian about it, and others are, are, are rather lax. But a technical check is done to make sure that the manuscript does not self-identify authors, uh, generally corresponds with the stylistic guidelines of the journal, including length. Uh, at different journals vary in terms of how much they enforce this. And if it passes a technical check or a first screening, then it's passed on to the responsible editor if there's an editorial team. Now, I, I think that in this part, this is where the technical check process is changing, especially as we move towards electronically based journals where page limits and word lengths don't matter as much. Uh, I think there is more flexibility in terms of word count and page length, although not all journals enforce this with equal draconian, or with, e with equal fervor. But whatever the technical check process is, uh, once it passes that, it will be then sent on to the responsible editor. Uh, if it is sent back to you after a technical check, this is not a desk check. Uh, even some senior scholars are confused by this. So they'll get a uh, technical check back from the editorial office where it says that, well, we're not going to proceed with this manuscript because there are certain things that are not quite right with it, like uh, you, it's not blinded or if it's really very, very long and beyond the scope of the word limit, or if uh, there is some stylistic problem, they'll send it back to you to fix it. Uh, but this does not mean it's desk rejected. It merely means that you need to fix some things before it is considered for review. 
Now, the second stage is once it gets past the, the process of initial check, there is a review process. And the review process varies by journal, uh, in some ways very considerably. Uh, top journals tend to have the same kind of review process. Uh, there's initial, there is an initial reading after the technical check by the responsible editor. Now, the editor uh, can choose at that moment to decline to review or what is called a desk reject. Uh, this is because in the editor's view, the probability of successful, uh, uh, a success of this manuscript in terms of the review process is very low or in the uh, eyes of the editor, the uh, manuscript does not fit the mission of the journal or there's something else that's quite majorly wrong with it. Uh, generally, uh, when editors desk reject or decline to review, it's because it doesn't fit the scope of the journal, or it is in the estimation of that editor that this manuscript does not have a high probability of successfully passing through the review process. And you know, this is important because editors are concerned about putting in front of a reviewer something that uh, would that they themselves would not accept uh, because there's a great deal of reviewer fatigue that uh, we go to reviewers a lot uh, and we're asking them to donate their time and this is all pro bono and for free so we don't want to waste their time with something that really we don't believe is going to pass muster once you get past by the way the test rejector declined to review percentage varies by journal uh, I know the current editors at APSR have kept it around uh, about 30%. Uh, that's where we were when I was editor-in-chief of APSR. The desk rejects are around 30% of all submissions. I will say, however, there are some journals who are quite proud of this, that their desk reject rate is over 50%. Uh, International Studies Quarterly, uh, at least one editorial team ago, had reported desk reject rates of 53%, which is rather it's inordinately high. I would say that most top journals have a desk reject rate of around 30%. 53% is a bit high. Now, if the decision is to review, then uh, the editorial team will identify a pool of potential reviewers. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, editor will identify if they want to get at least three completed reviews, will identify nine potential reviewers. This is because many say no uh, and refuse to do a review. Uh, if they say yes, which is really not always the case, then the manuscript is sent to them with instructions on how to conduct the review. Uh, now, even if they say yes, not everyone returns a, a review. I mean, I'd say about only about two thirds who said yes actually completed the review process. That's why we have to look for most, many more reviewers than the three that we usually require before we make a decision. Uh, the decision, once the review process or the reviews are returned, the editors will make a decision if there are sufficient review reports. Now. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that uh, most all top journals will require at least two reviewer reports. Uh, the APSR does this, AGPS I know does this, this too. And that uh, when you, if, if you get two reviewer reports and they're both negative, then a rejection decision will be made. If it's not clear that a rejection is recommended by both reviewers, then we'll usually wait for a third review. Okay. Uh, what that what that means then is that the longer the process, the more likely that if you if you get a quick decision, it's going to be a reject. If it's a slower decision, you have a better chance. Uh, generally speaking, the process takes about three to four months. I think most all journals say about ninety days. I know some journals try to say they have a turnaround of sixty days, and and there has been a move towards uh, speeding up the process. But generally, it takes about three to four months. Uh, I would say with the advent of COVID, uh, that process has become much longer, uh, at least I'm, in, in my estimation, and as, as when I talk to uh, uh, editors of journals now, it's much more difficult to find reviewers. So it is taking a bit longer than three to four months.
Now, uh, once a decision or reviews are in, reviewers uh, send the comments for the author, but they also might send private comments to the editor. All major journals allow for uh, private comments to be submitted to an editor for a decision, uh, which is actually, uh, I, most reviewers are consistent in their comments to the author and consistent to their comments to the editors. However, there are the cases where uh, a reviewer may say one thing to an author and say something very different to the editor. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen, which means that editors are provided a lot more information about a manuscript or the review uh, than is provided to the author of the manuscript. So we always, whenever we made a decision, we made sure that uh, the authors knew that it was based upon a complete package of information we received from the reviewers. Uh, reviewers uh, have a, or journals have a scorecard that is also submitted. Uh, sometimes this varies. Sometimes there's like an actual score of zero to 100. Sometimes there's just categories to pick from, such as accept, accept with minor revisions, revise and resubmit, reject, et cetera. Uh, uh, sometimes they have both, both, both the uh, categorical judgment uh, and also a score. Uh, but that's part of what we get or what editors use to make a decision. Uh, the decision is based upon these uh, pieces of information. So we'll get the reviewer's report and editors will read them and they will look at the scorecard. They look at the recommendation and then they will process this to make a decision. And uh, journal, well, good journal editors should write an art, a, a letter explaining to you uh, how the decision was, how the decision came about and what was it based upon. Uh, the decision is based upon the pieces of information I've already mentioned, and you should receive a letter or an email that communicates the decision and the reviews and those should be attached. I will say that acceptance after first round of reviews is very rare. In our four years as editors of APSR, that never happened, never. There was never an acceptance after first review. More often the piece is either rejected and for the APSR, the rejection rate was about 92.5% or the authors are asked to revise and resubmit the manuscript. And we'll talk a little bit more about the revision, revise, resubmit process later. Uh, and it's important, I think, for uh, authors to note that, that with the referee reports they see, uh, they may appear to be positive. It does not mean it will be rejected. Editors have a lot more information than authors. And I might add that most reviewers are rather um, soft in their reviews. Uh, and so they'll say things like, oh, this is a very well organized and written piece. But then they'll say, uh, however, the introduction is flawed, the theory has gaps, uh, the data is unacceptable, and the analysis is trivial. But it was very well written. So often I have uh, angry authors saying, well, the reviewer said it was very well written and very well organized and you still rejected it. It's because reviewers tend not to be very mean when they write a review. So just because the public or free reports appear positive does not mean it will be rejected. You must read the reviews carefully. If you were invited to revise and resubmit a piece, and actually this is what I, I, I counsel my graduate students to look for, is to get the revise and resubmit invitation. Generally, if you're invited to revise and resubmit, there is a limit on how long you have to resubmit. Uh, and this, this varies by journal. Uh, generally, I think one of the mode uh, lengths I have seen is about six months. Now, having said that, you can also write the editor and say, may I have an extension on turning in my revise and resubmit. Like, editors are generally quite uh, cooperative in terms of providing such extensions. As you revise the manuscript, be careful to respond to the reviewer's criticisms and concerns. This does not mean you have to agree with all the reviewers' criticism and concerns. In fact, you'll find that in some cases, in many cases, reviewers will say opposite things, right? Uh, 
what editors are looking for and what reviewers are looking for is whether or not you responded to your their criticism and concerns. Not that they agree with them, but if you don't agree with them and decide not to incorporate their criticisms into your manuscript, you should explain why you're not doing so in the responses in, in terms of the author's response memo. The editors will read the response memo. And it's the editor who makes a decision as to whether or not the uh, reviewer's your response is adequate. Now, uh, what often will happen is that you'll respond to the reviewer's criticisms and concerns and resubmit. And then the editor has a decision as to whether or not to send it back to the reviewers for uh, examination. And that's probably the most common thing one does or to send it back to uh, a selection of reviewers, not all the reviewers, but perhaps the most critical. Or the editor can decide that your response was uh, adequate enough so that they can proceed on to acceptance and publication. It is very important to write a carefully worded response memo when you submit or resubmit a revised and resubmit manuscript. Uh, upon receipt of the revision, the editors can send it out to the original reviewers, send it to the original reviewers, or maybe a new reviewer. That sometimes happens, especially when the original reviewers decide they don't want to review it again, or they can simply make an editorial decision. Usually the editors will communicate what they plan to do in their decision letter to you. And then the second review process can take another few months. And then, although we try to avoid having a third request to revise and submit, that has happened. Now, in the past, uh, I remember one of the, I won't name the editor in the 1990s, had a reputation of having uh, manuscripts reviewed six to seven times with six to seven revise and resubmits. And that doesn't happen anymore. That used to happen in the 1990s. It really doesn't happen anymore. Uh, most all editors are committed to shortening the review process so that you're not let along to have multiple invitations to revise and resubmit. If you're fortunate enough to have your manuscript accepted, once accepted, the next step is the production process. You will be asked to transfer copyright. Uh, most journals require, because their publishers require, that copyright is transferred. Okay. Uh, the manuscript will then be copyrighted. Uh, we comment on one, one thing about copyright to remember is that some publishers, when you transfer copyright, will take your piece and put it in their own produced edited volume. Now, that has happened to me several times. Uh, I, I frankly don't, I'm not that concerned about that. But for example, I think Routledge is quite commonly does that. They'll take uh, manuscripts that are published in a journal and then put them together with other manuscripts they hold copyright and then produce an edited volume. Uh, just to that you're aware of what, what you're doing when you're transferring copyright. Uh, once accepted, the manuscript will be copy edited. There may be multiple rounds of copy editing. Uh, the copy editing might be done by the publisher. Cambridge University Press generally does it for the APSR. Or it might be done by the journal itself. Routledge often has um, the journals do the copy editing. Uh, you'll be asked to correct and return page proofs to the publisher in a very short time. Uh, usually about 72 hours that you'll get a PDF copy edited version of your manuscript. You will have a roughly 72 hours to uh, review. Now, they, they aren't that draconian about enforcing it, but it means that uh, if you're expecting to get page proofs, be ready to turn it around quickly. Then you wait until it appears. You know, many journals publish online before it appears in print. They call this early view or first view. Um, the, uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, APSR, we called it early view. Uh, first view has been used by other journals. Uh, now this means that your piece will appear online before it's in print, but as far as the publishers are concerned, your a manuscript is published. If it's assigned a DOI code and put on a PDF online, they consider it published. Uh, however, the hard copy version or the print issue may take as long as a year further before it comes into full production. Uh, by the way, page numbering is changes between the online and final print version, but otherwise the online and print versions are exactly alike. Okay. 
the entire process from initial submission to publication can take up to a few years. Uh, and this is generally the case for most of the top journals. Uh, some things to consider as you proceed to submit to a journal. Uh, before you submit, make sure you understand the mission of the journal. Okay, now for like the APSR, AJPS, uh, the, big, the the top journals tend to be generalist journals. They'll, they'll, they'll take almost anything from any subfield, but you know, many other journals don't. I mean, top comparative politics journals will consider things in comparative politics and not in political theory. Uh, some journals that in international relations uh, have frowned upon pieces that appear to be only in comparative politics. So before you submit, make sure you understand the mission of the journal before you submit. Uh, if it is not clearly stated, check out what has been recently published in that journal, and that'll give you an indication as to the kinds of uh, uh, topics they tend to consider. Now, make sure that your manuscript is formatted for the journal. I, I think also there's varied. I, I know that a lot of senior people think, well, they could ignore formatting just because they're important. And so many people don't. But I think if, if you're unsure or if you're a new scholar, make sure your manuscript is formatted for the journal. The editorial team will appreciate that. And if you follow the page or word limit guidelines, they will appreciate that too, as well as following their style guidelines, such as in text versus footnotes, uh, uh, Chicago versus APA or whatever. But if you follow these guidelines, uh, this will make a positive impression on the editorial team. Make sure the piece is carefully edited before submitting. Uh, reviewers tend to notice grammatical errors and spelling mistakes and this does affect their judgment. Make sure the manuscript that you submit is the best possible work you can do. Editors, editors notice that you, are, uh, that you bother to look up style guidelines and every positive impression helps in uh, leading to a positive outcome for your submission. Make sure that you write some kind of cover letter, although it can be quite short. You know, some, some some uh, authors think the cover letter is really important and they'll write a 10 page cover letter. I have never met an editor who reads a cover letter except to just glance at it. Uh, all editors, and I'm one of them, we don't really read the cover letter. What we read in a submission is the abstract and writing a good abstract is very, very important. It is the first thing that the editors will see. It is the first thing the reviewers will see, and it makes an impression on the reader. If your abstract is poorly written or merely a copy and paste of the first paragraph of your introduction, that does not bode well for the review of your manuscript. Make sure you write a good abstract that tells the reader and the editor what the project is about and what is the major contribution of the piece to the existing scholarship? That's important. Okay, some frequently uh, uh, asked questions. What's a desk reject? Well, editors may decline to review your desk reject. Uh, APSR, AJPS, JOP is around 20 to 40%. We were around 30%, others are 50%. Uh, again, for desk reject in their judgment, the manuscript does not have a good chance of surviving the review process. And this saves you from wasting your time and saves the reviewer's time because there's a perceived problem with reviewer fatigue. Uh, what do you do after a desk reject? Often the manuscript should be sent to a more specialized journal that speaks to a particular audience. That's a common uh, basis for a desk reject, especially for the top journals. Although everyone wants to get into the APSR, AJPS, or JPA, GOP, sometimes it's better to have your work published in journals that speak to an audience you want to speak to. You know, frankly, I do this a lot. I, I, I submit a lot of my work to party politics because I study political parties and those who are interested in political parties read party politics like the Bible. Uh, it is still a very well-respected, highly ranked journal, but it's not one of the general journals like APSR, HGPS, or JOP. Now, how long does it take? Uh, it takes about three to four months, but some are shorter, some are a lot longer. Uh, remember, editors are dependent on reviewers and that these reviewers aren't paid, so it takes time. Although it may say on the website that minimal reviews completed, when you keep checking the reviews on, on 
editorial manager or scholar one. This only means that there are a minimum number of reviews to make a decision, usually two, but are not enough to make a decision. In other words, if there says two and you haven't heard and it says minimal reviews completed, it's, that usually indicates that the two reviewers are split and they're waiting for a third review. Uh, when is it okay for you to contact an editor about a manuscript you submitted? Uh, don't contact an editor at exactly 90 days and demand a response. Do not do that. What you should do is after about 90 days, not exactly on the 90th day, write a polite note to ask about the status of the review process. Uh, you are likely to accelerate the process. One thing is that even though editors are pinged and reminded electronically that you know, some manuscripts have taken time to get uh, a decision, you know, editors forget. I mean, you know, when we were editors, we got around 1,100 manuscripts a year. Uh, now I understand the APSR is up to 1,800 manuscripts a year. You know, sometimes people forget and sometimes they need to be reminded. So uh, writing a polite note, reminding the editor that you, know, you have a manuscript under review and you want to check on its status might be just enough to remind them that they need to make a decision and will accelerate the process. Okay, what if you get a revised resubmit? Okay, look carefully at the reviewer's comments and the editor's letter. The editor will usually suggest to you what comments you should pay careful attention to. However, do not only focus on the editor's letter and to ignore the reviewer's comments. A well done revised resubmit is when you address all the comments of the reviewers. You don't have to agree with them, but you have to answer them and respond to them. Uh, it's okay not to follow all the suggestions, but make sure that you have a good reason and explain it in the letter you write back to the editors, the review memo. When you submit your revision, always attach a letter or review memo that details changes you have made in response to the reviewer's concerns. Do not simply write a letter refuting everything the reviewer said and imply that they are all idiots, as well as the editor who selected them. This is the surest way to have your resubmission rejected. This happened twice at the APSR, that uh, two senior scholars simply said that the reviewers were idiots and they refused to make any revisions. Uh, we, had no, uh, we, we had no compunction to re not reject them. We did, we rejected them because they simply did not respond to the reviews. Don't do that. What if you get a reject? Well, there's an old saying in the United States of get back on the horse after you fall off. Make revisions before sending it to another journal. Uh, if you get a reject, don't simply turn it around and send it to another journal immediately. The reason is, is because we don't live in a very big world. There is a good chance that the reviewer who originally reviewed the piece will see it again somewhere. And if they see it again and you have done nothing to respond to their concerns for the original reviews, they will simply reject you. So never simply turn it around without any revisions whatsoever. Treat it as some form of revise and resubmit, even though it's a rejection. When you're uh, trying to get it published, go down the line, meaning start you know, where, wherever you want to enter in terms of a journal and keep submitting. Believe that everything you write will be published somewhere. Maybe not the APSR, but it will be published somewhere. Uh, and remember, everyone gets rejected. Uh, I, I love baseball um, and I love baseball metaphors. Uh, so no one ever bats a thousand. No one gets 100% hits. In baseball, batting 300 lifetime will get you into the Hall of Fame in the United States. That's a 30% success rate, but it's only 30%, not 100%. Mine is much less, by the way. However, you can get many at bats, and the more at bats you get, the more likely you'll get a hit. And a career can be made from hitting a lot of singles and doubles, not just home runs. Uh, one thing that uh, I as an editor and my fellow editors don't like is when you have uh, you, you get rejected and then you write the editor and say you will refuse to review for the journal until you get accepted to that journal. I have received messages like that in the past. It is unprofessional and you will look foolish and frankly be the butt of editorial jokes for editor, forever because editors talk to each other. We all did. I knew the editors of AJPS and JOP and PRQ quite well. And we'd often get together in conferences and talk about these kind of strange stories we had to share. And some of them, we knew who the people were and you would become the butt of editorial jokes forever. What if you get an acceptance? Well, you should go celebrate and have a drink. 
that's what I always do. Uh, and then write the next paper. Very rarely is one's career made by one publication. And finally, always have projects at different stages of completion, much like a pipeline. There are some new things, some conference papers, some things submitted, some things being revised, and some things being finalized. Use the time that one paper is under review to work on something else. Uh, keep up the momentum. That is how one makes a career publishing. And so I have some sources uh, uh, on this uh, uh, PowerPoint slide. I can also share this uh, with the uh, chair uh, who could distribute it to anyone who's interested in. And finally, uh, a book just came. I should, it's self-promoting. Uh, Dr. Well, Marika Bruning and my, myself have just published a book, came out last month on how to get published in the best political science international relations journals, understanding the publishing game. Uh, this book lays out a step-by-step -step process on how to maximize your success in terms of uh, getting your work published. So that ends my talk today. And uh, thank you for having me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is such an uh, informative and such a great uh, presentation about the editor's perspective, uh, which is, by the way, uh, quite rare to get um, uh, from the uh, viewpoints of uh, normal scholars who are kind of interested only in publishing. Uh, uh, but by the way, we don't have uh, much information about the public publishing game, as John mentioned uh, on the outset. And by the way, congratulations on your new book. Uh, yeah. and, uh, uh, sounds very relevant uh, for this panel as well. Uh, so like I said, I mean, this panel is uh, valuable uh, because it's, uh, it's not often, it's, uh, it's quite rare to have uh, the perspective of the editors in terms of the publications or publishing strategies. Uh, I mean, if, you, if we can uh, use an analogy of David Easton's uh, political system theory, we are all in the side of demand, but yep. we don't necessarily understand the decision-making processes, yep. the so-called black box. Yep. Uh, so I hope that this panel will uh, open the black box uh, about 80% or 90% or even 30%, yep. uh, as John has mentioned, in terms of the uh, successful uh, uh, baseball player uh, Hall of Famer, and I like that analogy as well. Uh, okay, so let's go to uh, our two pre prestigious discussants. Uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning that we have uh, one of the, uh, well, uh, two of the most uh, productive uh, research scholars in the nation, Professor Kim and Professor Wu. Uh, so I'm so pleased and uh, so uh, honored to have uh, both of you uh, joining this panel. And uh, we have heard a lot uh, about publishing uh, game or getting publishing from John. And uh, we are also interested in how to get our, pub our papers published. So uh, I guess uh, Professor Kim and Professor Wu would share their own experiences uh, and strategies uh, uh, with us. So uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Kim nam -gyu, would you go first? Yeah, sure. So let me share my short. Hello everyone, so my name is nam -gyu Kim. I'm at, at Korea University. Uh, so thank you for your presentation, Professor Nishama. Right? So he explained very well the whole publication process and also he shared right, very important tips for uh, publication with us, right? So for example, suggesting potential reviewer is very important. Also writing good abstract is really critical, right? So in the editor decision making also, right? So many times if you submit a paper to a journal, you wonder how to contact editor, right? So he also explained that part. So I think I also learned a lot and I believe this information will be very important and very helpful for Korean scholars and students. So here as a discussion, I will do two things. 
Uh, uh, I will ask some question to uh, Professor Ishama. So I have several questions. I'm personally curious. And before asking question, I also like to talk about some additional point that were not addressed in the presentation. Okay, so let me start. So I believe, I think, right, so publication, right, is determined by three factors, right? So first, right, so we should have really good research idea, right? So without good research idea, just having really nice empirical analysis or statistical analysis isn't enough, right? So we, the starting point is we need to have really good idea and we need to execute, right? So really solid research, right? So we should have really good research design and we should have really nice empirical result. But, right, so even though some paper with good idea and good research, right, so they, sometimes fail to be published, right? So having good idea and having good research does not necessarily mean the paper will be published because many times, right? So people fail to sell their paper to readers, right? So readers including, right? So editors and referees and other readers, right? So I think, so the last point, the how to sell paper is really important, I think. And I believe introduction is the place we need to sell our paper, I think. So introduction is right, so our opportunity to explain our research question, our empirical strategy, and we need to explain why, why this paper is important. So I think so introduction is particularly important because it gives first impression to referee, right? So I believe many referee will make first decision why reading introduction? And after reading introduction, I think referees will be looking for reason to reject the paper. Also, I think it, uh, writing good introduction is also very important to writing good paper. So if you cannot write a good introduction, maybe it imply you may be writing wrong paper. So I think maybe we need to work on, right? So introduction and main body of paper simultaneously and keep revising both parts together. So this is a very important part of paper, but many people do not spend much time on writing good in introduction. I think this is particularly true of some Korean scholar and Korean students. So when I review manuscript for Korean journals, I think introduction is often very weak. Also, they didn't include key requirements for the introduction. So I'd like to talk about right, so introduction. So when I look at the paper, I right, saw, so, I think many introduction in good journals tend to follow a certain pattern, right? So they, strategy might be different, but I believe there's a common pattern, right? So first one is motivation, right? So motivation is where we need to tell leader why the issue we study is important, right? So here we should motivate our research as broadly as possible. Right? And then we need to talk about our research question. So this is where we need to tell what we did, right? So here we should explain, we should clearly state our research question and explain how we are gonna answer it, right? And third one is result, right? So here we need to explain what we learned from my research, right? our research. And number four requirement might be, right, so main contribution. So this is about why this paper deserve to be published. So I think, Contribution should be uh, based on previous studies, right? So here we need to identify so previous studies that is critical to understanding the contribution of the paper. So we should describe so several or two or three contribution this paper will make relative to existing studies. I think I believe these four are uh, essential requirement of good introduction, but Number five, some people say, right, so we should have a roadmap of the paper, but I'm not sure, right? So I know, right, so there's some disagreement. Some people say this is really important and other people, no, we don't need to include it, right? So nowadays, I think, so given the word lengths, I do not include roadmap, but if I have some space, I tend to include roadmap, so. And also I think, so differentiating between motivation and main contribution, might be important. So I think in motivation, uh, knowing 
or understanding the topic itself is important. But number four contribution, again, should be based on existing literature. So I think that's why we should differentiate motivation and contribution. And others, right, so kind of related. Right? So writing should be clear and concise. So actually, to be honest, I complain a lot about review process referees. Oh my God, so this guy didn't read the paper. Also, oh, this, this guy is reviewed too, he's really stupid. He cannot understand what I'm saying, but that's my fault, right? So I didn't clearly express myself. Right? That's why our writing should be really clear and concise. We need to, we, do, we shouldn't create any misunderstanding. And the second tip is, right, so, I found that some, several people try to write a paper on determinants of certain, right, of dependent variable. Oh, I like to explore what causes A or what causes B, something like that. So, okay, this is right. So, uh, easier strategy to write a paper, but I don't think this is a really good paper. I think we should focus on certain right, specific variable, and we should focus on single causal mechanism. Right, so we should explore A or B or C. They will determine how or why. I don't think that's a good strategy. And let's also Professor Isham already emphasized right, proof reading and spell check really important, particularly important because we are not native English speaker. Right? So again, I believe right, referees always looking for reason to reject the paper. That's why we need to avoid these right, errors. Okay. And then I have some several questions uh, for uh, Professor Ishama. So Professor Ishama already explained, right? So having good abstract is really important, right? Because editor will decide um, whether to re reject the paper or not based on right, abstract. So he explained already, right? So good abstract should include, right? So what the paper is about, what is contribution about, I like to ask more, right? So I like to hear more specific things about good abstract. The second thing is about citation strategy, right? So I heard that some people suggest or recommend that, oh, in introduction, we need to cite our friends and we need, shouldn't cite any potential enemy. <laughs> or some people say, right? So when you submit your paper to a specific journal, you should, you should try to cite some papers already published in that journal. So I'd like to hear about some term, citation strategy, right? So I, I'm quite surprised that many people are really strategic in citing. Third one is about actually this uh, replication paper. So nowadays, right, so in many method courses, students tend to write replication paper as a term paper, right? So because replication practice exercise is really useful opportunity to practice their statistical analysis. Also writing duplication paper might be easier than just writing new research paper. But I think converting duplication paper to publication is a totally different animal. Actually, that might be more difficult. So I also have several experiences, right? so it's not that easy. So I'm wondering we should avoid writing replication paper, or if we pursue, right, so replication or comment paper, one might be good strategy, because as I know, nowadays, many journals tend to have section right, for replication or comment paper. So I'd like to hear some advice on it. And number four is, right, so this is based on my recent experience. So I submit paper to a journal, and the later editor said, oh, so this is a good paper. So here is just, I will give you just a minor RNR. So I was happy. So I tried to address all points made by reviewers. So I resubmit the paper. But later, editor sent me, oh, you should have additional RNR. And there was reviewer change. And the new reviewer, criticize what I did, but most of them was made because uh, in order to satisfy reviewer too. But that guy disappeared and new reviewer come in and criticize why you did this kind of thing. So I need to write so I don't know, uh, the second 
response paper uh, letter. So how to address this kind of situation is my fourth question. <laughs> and then number five question is kind of general thing, right? So as an editor, what kind of factor did you look at when you evaluate contribution of paper? Right? So let's say, let's assume that already the reviewer's comment is quite positive. Also, the quality isn't that bad. Then in that case, right, what kind of thing do you look at when you decide the paper is acceptable? Okay, so this is all. This is my comment, and thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Kim Nam Gyu. Uh, I think uh, Professor Kim has brought up a lot of interesting points and provided uh, good questions as well. And when I uh, was listening to his uh, discussion, I uh, have realized that, that uh, not only review processes vary by journals, but also the, my, my, my piece, I, like researching uh, uh, paper writings uh, might vary by a subfield or, or, or discipline in a subdiscipline in political science. Because I'm studying American politics and I'm uh, publishing my papers in American politics uh, journals. And especially I have some uh, uh, comments and questions on your point about determinant paper. Uh, and uh, we could talk about that later. Uh, and like I said, I mean, this is not, this panel is not necessarily about research paper presentation and, and uh, dis discussants will point out what's wrong, what's right. So I think this panel is uh, sort of a uh, educational uh, purpose panel, informative panel, uh, so we could share uh, various thoughts and experiences. And I think that's the main uh, and the whole point of this panel as well. So uh, thank you very much. And then uh, our, uh, our next uh, discussant, Professor Wu Biao Wan, uh, please. Thank you very much. Let me share uh, my screen first. All right, um, so I've learned a lot uh, from uh, Professor Ishiyama's talk, as well as uh, the discuss, uh, the comments uh, by Professor Kim Nam-gyu. I, I thought that I've, I've been in this business long enough to know all the wrinkles about publications, but then I still learned a lot uh, from uh, both, uh, both of the presentations. So um, this was really helpful for me. Uh, but I guess my mission is that um, I'm a discussant for this, uh, the, the panel. So, um, and I think the role, the, the reason why the uh, uh, Korean, uh, KAIS Korean Association of International Studies asked me to, uh, you know, serve as a discussant is because of my experience, from my experience as a reviewer and a, a writer, right, uh, you know, to submit to journals. So, I'll, I'll try to share some of my experience or you know things that I've learned as a reviewer and and, and a writer, sort of uh, a different angle from sort of uh, so Professor Ishiyama provided a sort of perspective from the editor. Now I'll I'll try to sort of um, give uh, give some comments, advices, so to speak, um, to and and this is this is a um, this is a part of a panels um, to serve junior scholars, right? Um, so, you know, it's, I guess uh, Professor Kim nam Yu and I are sort of in the middle of the stage where, you know, we, we are no longer considered as junior scholars, but we are not accepted as a senior scholars, right? So we are sort of junior, senior, senior, junior scholars, right? Um, and from the senior, junior scholars perspective, you know, what we've learned and um, what are some advices that we can give to sort of um, younger and emerging scholars. Um, so that's that's something that I'll do today. Uh, first, I'll start off with the questions to Professor Ishiyama, right? And these are things that I consider. And, you know, I, I'd love to hear from the editor's perspective, right? So how do you choose to which journal you submit your manuscript, right? You know, it's Oftentimes you can you can go with the uh, uh, American Political Science Review. If you get rejection, you go to AJPS, but it'll take years to land the publication, right? So that strategy is not a sort of that doesn't work for every paper that you write. So, you know, what are what are the things that you can consider 
when you choose to uh, submit your paper, you know, to which journal you submit, right? And the second question is, and, and this happens, right? You know, this happens, just your viewers just hate you. Uh, <laughs> they're very aggressive um, and their, their comments are not very constructive, right? And, you know, if, if two reviewers suggest R&R &R and one reviewer is just really bad, um, and you know, editors based on the reviews of uh, the reviews, then you know, two R and R and one rejection, you know, your paper will get rejected more likely. Uh, but then, how do you deal with it? Because clearly, this third reviewer or the second reviewer, which is always the problem, right? Uh, the second reviewer, uh, you know, it's how do you deal with this uh, this issue? Do you write back to the editor? Is it? You know, it's and you know, it's if there's any chance that you can salvage your your manuscript, um, that would be my second question before I start my comments. Okay, so these are my uh, questions. Um, uh, just adding two cents on Professor Ishiyama's talk, um, and I think there is a lot of overlapping um, of my comments with uh, uh, Professor Kim Nam Yu's comments. So. I think uh, you know what I what I will suggest is that preparing your manuscript is really important, right? And um, I will say you need to write well. And this is again something that uh, Professor Kim Nam Yu also uh, emphasized. But I don't mean that you need to write beautifully, but you need to be a good science. You need to do a good job of uh, writing good scientific research, right? And there's a clearly a difference, right? You know, if if you ask me to write a beautiful poem, I will fail every time, right? <laughs> but you know, it's but because I've been in this business for long enough, I know what a good scientific writing is about, right? So, and that's something that you need to get used to. Um, and I think you know the the rule of thumb that I emphasize to my student is that if readers can understand your paper, you know, with all the things that Professor Kim Nam Gyu mentioned. Uh, if I can add a few, um, if readers can understand your paper by reading only the first sentences of each paragraph, I will call it a success, right? Um, so, and that, that should be something um, you have in mind uh, when you write your paper. The other thing that I, I would emphasize is that you should avoid writing long sentences, right? It's our job as a writer um, to make readers understand. And, you know, this is unlike of, you know, it's uh, literatures, right? You should not, you should not uh, allow any imagination on the reader's part, <laughs> right? So sh you should be really straightforward, um, concise and accurate. Um, and that's something that you want. Um, so that's, uh, those are uh, sort of my two cents on preparing your manuscript. Um, and then after uh, preparing your manuscript, sending it off to, uh, to a review, you know, what you can expect, right? Um, and I noticed that uh, over the past 10 years or so, now the desk rejections are becoming more and more common, right? So ISQ, uh, Professor Ishiyama just told us that it's over 50%, right? So, you know, th that initial bar is relatively high now, right? And, but, you know, it's, if your desk rejected, that's fine, right? Um, and I think that might be actually a blessing in disguise because you didn't need to go through the whole process, right? Um, here's a very seasoned scholar serving as an editor who says, uh, you know, either it, it's not a good fit to a journal or, you know, it has a, a very slim chance of uh, getting an R&R, &R, right? You know, it's, so, you know, if you get that response, it's good, right? Without, you know, without waiting for, you know, four months, um, that's actually a blessing, right? You need to go to your, your next alternative. So I think desk rejection, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad thing that happened to you, but, you know, it's after a day, you can consider that as a blessing. So that, that would be my advice. Second one is, uh, Again, this is a trend that I've noticed. Um, you know, review processes are getting a lot faster in general. So, you know, back in 2014 or something, you know, I've submitted a, a, a manuscript and, you know, I think everyone in this room 
might have an experience. Um, you know, I've sent this to a journal and I've waited six months. No, no response from the editor, nothing. I've sent an email, very polite email to the editor, no response. And this, this editor, by the way, is a really well-known scholar in international relations, international political economy. No response, uh, another two months uh, passed, so eight months. No response, I've sent another email. And um, at the 11th month, I got the uh, decision, rejection. So I've, you know, I've wasted a whole year by just waiting, but I think this is, this experience is getting rarer and rarer. So, so review processes are getting a lot faster. And I also have to emphasize that some journals are a lot better. That means some journals are a lot slower than others. Um, so, you know, for instance, I can recommend the review of international organizations um, because the editor is really adamant uh, to reviewer, you know, it's, it's four weeks, um, you will be pressured from the editor. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's been four, uh, four weeks that you have agreed to review. We have not received your review. You need to submit your review in the next week or so, right? Um, and if, if editor knows you, then he or she will send the, send the email again and again, right? So, you know, it's, uh, and so I've submitted a lot of uh, 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 manuscript to review of international, not a lot, probably like three or four uh, manuscript to, um, to the review of international organizations. And I think the mean review time has been less than two months. So, you know, that, that's, and I think that's getting uh, more and more common uh, because what I, what I hear as a reviewer is that, the, you know, you, you have only one month to complete your review. Of course, I do not uh, follow that guideline always, but, you know, that's, that's the pressure that reviewers get these days, right? So some journals are a lot better. And uh, thankfully, you can find information. A lot of uh, journals now publish these information on their websites. So you know, it's uh, mean review time um, in the past year, you know, it's 45 days to a first decision, right? Uh, something like, you, you know, those information. So if you're in a hurry and if, you, if, you, if you're considering a few journals, this could be another factor that you can, cons you can sort of factor in um, when, you, when you decide to which journal that you, you, you want to submit your manuscript. So, sort of adding two cents on Professor Ishiyama's talk, and then um, sort of uh, general advice to uh, junior scholars. I think it's really important to um, have, a, uh, have a, you know, experience this publication process with a seasoned co-author. I think that could be a really, uh, really valuable. And I know Professor Ishiyama does a lot, of, a lot of this, guiding sort of his graduate students in, you know, sort of, gently into this publication process by co-authoring with them, right? And that's, uh, that's, that's really invaluable. So having good co-authors um, who, who knows this uh, publication process in and out uh, can really help you, right? Uh, just walking through the publication process with you. And sometimes now, now that I'm sort of uh, 10 years, 11, 12 years of, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, removed from my uh, PhD, um, you know, it's, you know, we need to deal with a lot of different stuff, you know, teaching service, etc. But having this pressure from your co-authors can make you a little bit more efficient, marginally, but still, uh, you can be more efficient by having uh, pressures from your co-authors. So I guess that's another strategy that you can use by having uh, co-authors with you. And then, you know, you, you become friends with your co-authors many times, you know. It's, um, I still see my co-authors, so I think that's a good sign. Um, you know, it's, uh, so researchers, uh, research can now become less dull sort of efforts um, and can become uh, fun, right? Um, so, you know, having a good co-authorship um, um, is, is really important, especially at the very beginning of your sort of uh, career. I think that I, so that's something that I would recommend. Um, 
And um, this is uh, speaking from my personal experience, papers rejected multiple times. Um, so the first of all, I think we should say this, right? And this is something that Professor Ishiyama just told us. Um, and I'm surprised that, you know, his uh, at bat record is below 300. Uh, but, um, you know, but that's, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of, that's still a lot better, right? Better than sort of the average, right? So we all get rejected um, and getting multiple rejections for a paper before getting published is also very common, right? Um, and that's because reviewers are trained, programmed, it, you know, it's more like a programmed to be critical, right? So acceptance is extremely rare. I think Professor Ishiyama told us that uh, APSR under his uh, guidance was the acceptance rate was about uh, seven or eight percent, right? Um, and you know, the top journals are uh, well below ten percent, right? Including APSR. So, you know, its acceptance is, and you know, it's. We should keep in mind that you know, it's manuscripts that that are sent to the APSR are the things that scholars think that they're their best works, right? But still the acceptance rate is uh, really, really, really low. And really good journals uh, under 10%, um, respected uh, sort of subfield journals are still, you know, at around 10%, 12%, right? So, um, you know, it's, if you are hitting, um, you know, it's, at around 200, I think that's that's still considered good, right? Um, so acceptance is extremely rare. RNR is a success, so you should celebrate, uh, you know, and rejection is the modal category, overwhelming modal category. Um, and reviewers can be at times a bit too harsh, um, but you need to move on. So those are uh, sort of, um, and you know, it's, but then you should not give up on your, your work, right? So I've, I've had this paper that was, uh, that was in the review cycle since 2011. Since it, 2011, I first sent it, so this was before your time at APSR, but I sent it to um, APSR and, you know, it was sort of two, uh, two reviewers uh, giving r and &R, one reviewer saying rejection. So we moved down the sort of the ladder. So we, we sent it to AJPS, it got rejected. We sent it to somewhere like ISQ rejected, uh, economics and politics rejected. We had really high hope, right? Uh, because, you know, APSR said, you know, two uh, RNRs, you know, it's, so it was a good sign. Um, it took nine years to finally get that paper published and probably like nine rejections along the way. So. Um, but you know, we, we kept sending it out and you know it worked out. So it was it was published as a Ur and Berdier 2020. So um, but that happens. So do not give up. Um, um, the last thing that I will touch on is the response letter. Um, and I think this is something again uh, Professor Ishiyama uh, told us, but you need to try to address all comments. And here what I will do is I will share actually um, one of my response letters, uh, recent response letters, so that hopefully the junior scholars can sort of see what it's like to write a response letter. So this is a response letter that I wrote um, in May, 2021. Um, so um, this is editor, I guess it's okay to, to share everything, right? Um, because this is my writing, right? Um, so, um, so, of course, you need to start polite, right? By thanking the editor, uh, grateful for strong support, um, sort of, uh, you know, it's highlighting that there was a strong support um, <laughs> because, um, and that's important. And, and then uh, we first addressed editor's concerns, right? So the editor ed uh, sort of raised a few concerns and we sort of uh, quote editor's concern and we list out the things that we did to address um, editor's concern. Uh, there was another minor concern. So we, we tried to address that minor concern as well. And again, this is like an introduction, right? Introduction of your, your manuscript. The rest of this memo addresses uh, reviewers. So how it's organized, then reviewers comments, reviewer one. Again, this is reviewer one's comment, our response. 
review one's comments and our response. Review one's comments and our response. So it goes on and on and on. And we try to address all the, uh, you know, sort of uh, points raised by uh, both. Uh, I think we had three reviewers actually. Yes, uh, so we had three reviewers. So, and in addressing uh, all the reviewer comments, it took 10 pages, right? So it has to be really a detailed comments to every, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, to, uh, every point raised by the reviewers, uh, whether it's a uh, sort of, um, you know, gentle um, disagreement, <laughs> or uh, you know, fully sort of incorporating the, the, the criticism into revising your paper. So um, there's that, but I think uh, reviewers all have egos, right? So you know, I think the safe way is to sort of start by thanking them, right? Um, and praising how wonderful that comment is. And then of course, then you know, sort of moving on to the sort of substantive uh, response to each comment. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share my experience as well as um, raising questions to Professor Ishiyama again. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu Uh Professor Wu uh, is so nice and kind enough to share his own writing in terms of response letter. Uh, it's a very valuable kind of uh, information for uh, all of us, not just junior scholars, senior scholars. I mean, everyone uh, in political science field who, are, who is interested in publishing their papers, uh, this is a great uh, information uh, uh, we could uh, think about. Um, so we, uh, Professor Wu has mentioned something about rejection uh, as well. So, I mean, yeah, of course, acceptance is always a, a happy news we've been waiting for, but uh, rejection is uh, kind of much more often news we, uh, we can hear in this business. And I believe that, I mean, as everyone else, like everyone else, I mean, I had a good experience of rejection because I, I, I won, uh, about 10 years ago, I submitted my paper to a lower rank journal and I got, I got rejected, but with very two good uh, uh, review uh, comments. So I incorporated uh, that reviewer's comments into my paper, and then I submitted this paper to party politics, uh, like uh, uh, John has mentioned, and I got accepted and, uh, in only three months. <laughs> so it was kind of my wonderful experience. So don't be discouraged, don't be upset. Uh, just uh, uh, my professor at the University of Texas at Austin has told me that, oh, John Kern, uh, don't be worried, but this is the business we have signed up onto. So, um, all righty. So we had uh, presenters presented and uh, two discussants uh, sharing their thoughts. And then before we would ask John to uh, make his own uh, feedback and comments and answers, let me just share uh, my uh, couple of uh, thoughts as well as a, as a moderator, I don't do this uh, uh, often, but only because we have a plenty of time. <laughs> so I, uh, I have a couple of things to share as well. Uh, first thing is about desk reject. Uh, I mean, like I said uh, as well, desk reject is not necessarily a bad thing from my uh, own experience. I, uh, my experience is that I submitted my paper, which uh, was touching upon American politics, 80%, Korean politics, 20% to American politics review. And then I got a desk reject uh, the, from the editor of American politics review, but his comments uh, uh, in email form were kind of two page long and why he had to reject this paper, why he had to desk to reject this paper. Uh, and then uh, I uh, could save my time. I, I could save my energy. And then I turned around to uh, uh, rewrite this paper to submit uh, to other journals. So the desk reject is not necessarily a uh, terrible experience. And in terms of roadmap, uh, as Professor Kim nam Gyu has mentioned in his presentation, I think that's a kind of delicate thing to deal with. Um, uh, 
I, I, my suggestion is that uh, in your uh, last paper, last uh, segment of your paper, uh, to include your research uh, roadmap or future research agendas uh, will be uh, will be good, will be okay. Uh, but when I uh, teach in Korea, when I talk to my students in Korea, uh, one thing common I can find in their papers is that at the uh, final conclusion part, they tend to include the limits of this paper. Uh, the uh, uh, weak points of this paper. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I jump into saying that don't do this, don't do this. I think this has a lot to do with kind of cultural approaches because we Koreans uh, love to be humble. Uh, so this paper is not that great. This paper has some weak points, but no, 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 no way. I mean, that you, I mean, you, you should uh, brag about your paper. This is one of the greatest papers ever written in political science. You should do that. I mean, that's what I'm telling my students in terms of publication strategies. And uh, I uh, also have reviewed many papers, especially in the uh, subfield of uh, American politics. Uh, and I, uh, normally I tend to reject the papers uh, largely because the, the literature review part is bad. So I'm always paying attention to the literature review part in the paper. If the literature review is not good enough, then I cannot ever uh, uh, accept this paper or give an r, &R. So uh, not only abstract, but also the literature review part is also very critical. And finally, uh, the uh, determinant paper, as Professor Kim Dam Gyu has mentioned, uh, in the subfield of American politics, well, I'm not a spokesperson uh, for, for, the Amer for the American politics field, but uh, we tend to write the paper as a kind of lab report, uh, meaning that uh, we set up the research question first, uh, and then uh, we will explore, we will explain why this is the case uh, compared to the literature review, compared to uh, given uh, or using the independent variables. So uh, determinant papers might be uh, kind of uh, sort of interesting topic to talk about later uh, in terms of which subfield uh, you're in, uh, in terms of political science. Okay, so uh, we should invite John back again to give his own, uh, own thoughts and answers. So John, please. Uh Thank you for really some wonderful comments. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you saw it, but I shook my head, yes, for most all the comments that were made, because I think they were just great. Uh, for, uh, you know, uh, Professor Kim nam uh brings up many important points. So one, I, I, well, the introduction is absolutely critical. I mean, the abstract is the first thing we read, but the second thing is the introduction. And uh, this is, I must say that, one of the number one reasons for rejection at the APSR is criticisms about framing the article. You know, framing it, it's like, why is this important? What is, why should, some, why should the reader be excited about it? You know, too often, I think that students think that writing a sophisticated, methodologically sophisticated piece or the most methodologically sophisticated piece is good enough and they ignore the introduction. You know, uh, that is the number one reason why papers are rejected is because the paper is not adequately framed. So yes, 100% agree with Professor Kim nam Kyu that uh, the introduction is critical, perhaps the most critical first part of any paper. Uh, I might add one thing just to the introduction is that one thing I, I begin to see is in addition, something commonly called the puzzle, right? Which is sort of the motivation, right? And often it begins with a little story Right, that uh, that there's some example, there's some puzzling thing that the person, the author read or is knows about, and says, "Why is that?" And and so many uh, articles in, in some of the top journals now begin with this puzzle, which I think speaks to you know the introduction. It, it, by stating a puzzle, you draw the reader in, and I as a reader will say, "Yes, that is very curious. Why does it happen that way?" And so and that that really helps lay out to the reader very clearly what it is the author is after. 
Um, so a puzzle or like a little vignette that explains some puzzling example in the real world helps with the introduction. Now, uh, Professor Kim Lam Kyu had some uh, specific questions. And, you know, again, I think this varies by journal, but things that I use, for example, in a good abstract, yeah, you know, a lot of journals use what they call the OMRC, OMRC approach, which is short for objective importance, methods, results, and conclusion. Because you only have 150 words to 200 words for an abstract, so you have to be very economical on your what you say. So I always think about, you have to have some objective to the research and importance. You know, it's, it's, it's a statement, clear statement of what you're doing, and why that's important. That's got, that has to be in there. The second is you do want to talk a bit about the methods, not in great detail, but what techniques are you using and why is that appropriate to the question you pose? The third is you have to provide some sense of your results, not just stop and say, well, the results are to be ter determined later. I mean, you could do that for a conference abstract, but for an article, I, I want to see something about the results. And then a conclusion, what do your results say about that puzzle or that objective you started with? Now you have to be very carefully wording it because you only have 150 words. But when I look at an abstract, I look at the objective importance, the methods, the results and conclusion. That's what I look for. Okay, um, citation strategy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I thought about this is that, you know, as soon as they try to cite your enemies to draw them in or just cite all your friends. I'm not sure about that, but I do think that for a journal, you want to cite pieces that appear in that journal. You do. Editors, you know, especially if they're long term editors, like to see that journal being cited in the manuscripts they're reviewing. Now, I, I will say there is an extreme example that I know of that I, I find actually reprehensible. There are some editors that will insist that if you don't have citations to their journal, and especially citations to the editor, they will not look kindly upon your piece. I know this has happened in at least two top journals where I find this unethical. I mean, it's okay to cite you know, uh, articles that appear in that journal. It's not okay to require authors cite you. That, 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 but you might come across that there. By the way, I should add that not all editors are good editors. There are many bad editors, and and this is anecdotal. But some of the worst editors are some of the most senior and famous scholars. Uh, I I think that's changing, and I think I think it's maybe uh, Professor uh, Wang Bangyun Byungwon who is saying that uh, you know uh, it's changing. It's getting better. Well, it's getting better because some of the senior, more famous editors are retiring to re be replaced by younger and more dynamic editors. I think, you know, old people go by the wayside and then I think uh, review processes get more efficient. Um, okay, citation center, I'm not sure about citing your enemies, but I, I do think it's important to cite uh, the manuscripts that appear in that journal. I, I think editors do look for that. Uh, replication papers, that's really important because replications are becoming much more common. You know, I was very much involved in an effort uh, at uh, promoting transparency at the APSR, you know, the DART initiative, which is data access and research transparency part, which was replication. But one issue that always come up, especially with the journals is where do replication papers go? I mean, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do a replication of studies and they, they perform a valuable service, but why do it if you're not gonna get it published anywhere? Uh, that, that, that is the dilemma. I'm not sure the discipline has fully uh, resolved that. However, I will say, there are some outlets. For example, uh, Sage publishes a journal called Research and Politics, which is actually an online open access journal, but it's, it's, it's actually fairly has high citation scores. Uh, they publish replication studies, and it is peer reviewed. Uh, there are, um, you know, JOP, Journal of Politics, has a special section which they, they call research notes, but really it's their section where they have replication studies. Now, part of the problem with replication studies, we're not really sure what they are. I mean, there are pure replications where you just take somebody's work and see if it replicates. That's a, you know, that's a simple replication. But then there are others like that do this. They say, well, let me take your results and then add a new variable or take a different data set, like a robustness check, which is another form of replication, which is not just simple replication. I, I would say that if you're going to be doing a replication of the latter sort, where you're actually adding a variable to the model, or you're using a new data set for a robustness check to check to see if the results replicate, that's a different piece. That I would submit to like, as a research note to JOP or uh, PRQ, uh, Political Research Reporting has research notes now. Um, 
actually APSR has letters, <laughs> a section called letters, which I still can't figure out what the editors are after, but I think they're after, you know, these kinds of not simple replication studies, but something like if I use the new set of variables, I've used a new uh, modeling technique. If I uh, use a new data set, do the, the results from some famous piece that's been published, do they hold? Uh, I think APSR under the letters section and JOP under research notes would consider that. Okay. Uh, however, I must also say that in the letter section of APSR and JOP's research notes, uh, the uh, word length is somewhere around 3,000 words. So it's not not full article length. So just, just to make sure that when we're talking about this, that you got to make them fairly short and to the point. So th there are increasing outlets for replication paper. I, and I think replications have an important role to play in our field to make sure that, you know, the results that we have really hold up because sometimes policymakers use our results to enact all sorts of policies, like, for example, in terms of IMF conditionality, which was based upon some faulty data that had been misentered by some graduate student at an uh, unnamed Ivy League school. So, you know, that that's, I think replications are important. There should be an outlet. I think uh, journals are providing that kind of outlet. Uh, now, uh, the fourth is yeah, the reviewer change. Yeah, this this happened. This is also, uh, I, in my view, a bad editor. Uh, editors uh, generally should, you know, and I was reluctant, and most of the other other editors I know were reluctant to, you know, essentially find a new uh, reviewer because that's actually, frankly, a little unfair, because you're writing your revised paper in response to the initial reviewers, and then you have somebody who has a completely different perspective, and then adds a whole range of other things. Um, most editors, now I, I can't say all, but most editors, if you remind them, like writing a short note and reminding them that, well, I had addressed all the, you know, reviewers' points from the initial round, and I, I'm willing to address the uh, comments of the new reviewer, but I, I might want some guidance on this. You know, is this is just, a, it, it does two purposes. It reminds the editor that they had made a decision based upon the re first round of reviews, and you have addressed all those. And also say that, well, the edit, you know, put the editor on the spot saying, well, what, what are some of the things you think I should focus on? I mean, you, you're free to do that, especially since, uh, you know, the editor selected a new reviewer. Now, the editor could say, well, just address everything they say. Well, then, then at least you pointed out that you asked them, well, why are you getting a new reviewer? But no, I think writing them and asking them for some guidance on, on the reviews um, or what the new reviewer says. Uh, now, the paper's contribution, that, that's a good question because that's really the most important thing. Now, how do we determine a paper's contribution? Now, I, I, I can't say that it's com what we did was common to all journals, but you know, one thing about the big, the general journals is that we publish a lot of different kinds of manuscripts, right? I mean, comparative politics and international relations, American politics, political theory, and, you know, usually there is kind of a team of editors, even at, at the, if, if, if for us, we had a four person team, other journals have the editor and then associate editors, but there's always some kind of meeting where I thought if I find an article compelling, and I think this is, we used to call it the cool factor, that this is a cool piece. Uh, and if I could convince my colleagues, the IR scholar, the political theory scholar, and the American politics scholar, that this was a cool piece, then I knew it had broad appeal beyond just my field. You know, and I think all general journals, HAPS is this way, APSR is this way, uh, other journals that aspire to be general, like BJPS, they, they look for that. They look for a piece that doesn't just appeal to particular niches, but is uh, appeals to lots of different scholars. They, that an Americanist could see the value of this contribution, that uh, an IR scholar would see the value of this, and that this is an interesting question with a very unique answer. That's what we're looking for. The top journals are looking for the great ideas that help shape our discipline. Now, I think some younger scholars believe that the APSR was looking for the most methodologically sophisticated piece of it. No. We are not looking for the most methodologically sophisticated piece you can do, right? That's not important. What is important is the idea. And if that idea is compelling to more people, we're going to publish it. That was our rule. And I, I'm pretty sure that's a JPS. I'm, actually, I'm positive that they told me that. That's what they do. 
Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's uh, true of most all other uh, major general journals. Now, of course, specialized journals are looking for something else. Like if it's party politics, they're looking for things that appeal to people who study party politics. And one thing I found that's very interesting to the editors of party, who I know quite well, uh, is that you know they get a lot of stuff on Europe and they get a lot of stuff on the developed world. Uh, they look very kindly on pieces about party politics that come from the global South or are about the global South or are about places that are not Europe. That's they, I, I know the editors are because they want to have a broad appeal to the range of scholars who study party politics. And, you know, I study the transformation of rebel groups into political parties, which is not in Europe. Uh, and so they like that kind of stuff. I know they like that kind of stuff. And I know the reviewers like that too, because it has broad and unique appeal. So yeah, I, I think that's what you're looking to do. Um, yeah, uh, Professor, Professor Wu Bing Wen, uh, I, I actually love <laughs> yeah, the idea of how do you choose which journal to submit your manuscript? Well, you know, I've always thought it's sort of like um, investment. It's like you want a diverse portfolio. You don't want to put all your investment in one, one, one stock. So you shouldn't do everything and say, I'm going to keep going to the APSR because that's just one stock. That will not pay dividends. You need to diversify your portfolio. Now, sometimes it depends. You may go for like the money, big money making high risk stock like APSR. But then sometimes you want to invest in things that are safer, things that you know that you have a very good shot of getting published and that will speak to an audience that you want to speak to. So you want to submit a variety of different pieces at a variety of different levels. Uh, I always thought that for, I tell my grad students that, you know, your temptation is to go for the very top. But remember, this will take two years before it gets published and you may not be able to get a job. Or some of my junior colleagues, say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go for the APSR right away. But they need to make tenure and tenure is based upon the number of publications. Submission to the APSR is not the basis for tenure awards. You have to get published. So I I, I, my advice to them is to take some things that you think are good that speak to your subdiscipline, like party politics or political behavior or uh, conflict or political economy and submit good pieces there. Now, if you have a really, really, really good piece that you want to take a chance on in a high risk stock, send it to APSR and AJPS. But I think you need to have a portfolio first, because as an editor, and I think this is still true. You know, editors are kind of human and, and they, they, you know, some of the decisions are hard to make. So every little bit counts, every little bit of information counts. If you're an author and they don't know who you are and never heard your name and never seen you published, chances are they're not going to be looking as favorably upon you as if I said, I said well, I know this person because, by the way, uh, it's a blind process, but not for the editors. And they can see you and they say, well, I know I've seen this person. This person's a rising young scholar. Maybe we'll take a look. Oh, these reviews, they're, they're sort of mixed, but maybe I'll take a chance on this person, especially if I think the idea is interesting and invite them to do an r, &R. I think the more you get your name out, it's sort of like being a, an aspiring Hollywood actor. The more you get your name out into the field, people will recognize you and editors will recognize you. So have as diverse and large a portfolio as you can get. And remember, as Professor Wu pointed out, always remember everything you publish will get published some, everything you write will get published sometime, even if it takes 11 years. But you have to keep getting at that and putting it out there. Okay, the last question I think that Professor Wu brought up was that, um, how do you deal with reviewers who hate you or hate your manuscript, right? Uh, there's this like joke about reviewer number two as being always the one that is just just hates you for whatever reason. Now, now I, you know editors are aware of some things. Uh, uh, we are aware of the practice of what we call gatekeeping. That it may not be hatred of you as, as a person, but they hate you or want to shoot you down because you they view you as a competitor. That 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 does happen. Um, you know, I, I think that if that happens, um, you know, what I normally do is, well, as an editor, a good editor should be able to screen that out, should be able to recognize gatekeeping when they see it. I, I, we came across a number of times where clearly the reviewer is just making stuff up to make sure that this piece never got published. 
And, and, edit, and that good editor should be able to see through that. That's why we have more than one review, right? Uh, however, um, you know, so I think what happens when, if you get like reviews and you get one reviewer that's just absolutely negative and the other ones are fairly positive, but you look at the negative one and it seems unreasonably negative, you can write the editor uh, pointing out at, before you resubmit that reviewer two is asking for many things that uh, are, are wrong or at least incorrect or, or ridiculous or uh, things that are unreasonable. And you can point that out to the editor. Now, the editor might still say, well, you still have to address these uh, and you should still try to address them, but you can write to the editor privately and express concern over reviewer two. Sometimes that will, what will happen, will be, the editor will decide that in the next r and they won't use reviewer two, that they'll just use reviewers one and three. You are free to do that. Uh, and, and I've done that myself, you know, that where I clearly think someone is, uh, you know, is, is out to get me and has unreasonable requests or hasn't really under, you know, it makes frankly stupid comments that are, you know, just uh, essentially done to torpedo the manager. I have written that. And sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. And they won't send it to reviewer two. I, I think you're free to do that. Uh, editors, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're public personalities. I mean, we've, we've taken on this role. We know that authors are going to write us. And sometimes we'll look at it and say, yeah, they have a point. And sometimes we won't. And sometimes editors do change their minds. So uh, a couple other things that Professor Wu pointed out that I think is important too. Uh, I think it's really important to make it easy for the readers to, uh, the reviewers to understand what you're saying. I think that's really important. Uh, you know, you can't, you shouldn't be a poet or you can't be sophist overly sophisticated and complicated in your writing. You want to make it crystal clear as to what you're doing. Because one thing reviewers hate and this is true for everything, including grant reviews, because I've worked on these too. They hate having to dig for information. They hate having to dig fast things that should be apparent that are buried somewhere. I hate that. And when I have to dig for something, I'm not going to accept your piece. you got to make it clear to me and make it easy for me to find out the information I think is important. Uh, uh, okay, and, and again, uh, just to mention, there are many bad editors. There are some of the worst are the senior famous people. <laughs> I'm sorry, they are because they're senior famous. They don't think they have to spend much time, you know, attending to their editorial responsibilities because it doesn't really impact them. I, I know that in the past, yeah, review uh, processes took years <laughs> to get finished, and they were unresponsive. I do think, though, you're right, Professor, that if things are changing. It is getting better, but I chalk that up to generational shifts. Not, not that you know, the senior editors are getting better because they're not. Uh, what's happening is they're retiring and being replaced by younger, more energetic editors. That, that's what I think is happening. Uh, on the response letter, yeah, I think it's really important to be polite. I have to second this. It's really, really important to be polite and to thank the reviewers for their comments and say that it has significantly improved the piece even though it may not have, <laughs> even though they may have been terrible reviewers, say that uh, it, the comments were well uh, taken and that they have significantly improved their piece because reviewers have egos. If you say that, then you stroke their ego, then they'll be more accepting of your unwillingness to change your manuscript. And so uh, I, I, I thank you very much, everybody, for your, for your comments. I really appreciate it. I think, you know, I, I try to address the questions I think that everyone posed, but if there are any other questions, I'll be more than willing to answer them now. All righty, all righty. So thank you so much. And you know what? I mean, time is almost up. I mean, oh, I, my. <laughs> we've got plenty of time, uh, but um, almost two hours has quickly passed. So, uh, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I think we have to open the floor. So is there anyone out there who has uh, a question for either John or Professor Kim Nam Yu or Wubyong Wan? I mean, this is virtual uh, uh, panel, so I don't see uh, many faces up on the screen. Uh, uh, okay, so here we go. So uh, Dr. Hwang In-jung, 
Yes. Okay. Uh, thank so you, everyone. Uh, I, I'm sorry if it's almost the time, but uh, I just wanted to thank you, everyone, for making this wonderful opportunity. I learned a lot, and it was very encouraging session <laughs> because everyone shared their experiences of being rejected. Uh, I actually had a, three questions, if, but if time allows, uh, you, you guys can answer it or, or not. Um, two questions as an author and one question as a, a reviewer, actually. So first of all, um, it's about the time frame. I do a lot of qualitative um, research. So I kind of do the interviews and archival researches. And I think there's some kind of time frame that makes some data relevant to the issues. So I cannot do the interviews like over and over, uh, right? Uh, so as Professor Wu said that sometimes it takes nine years. So it was encouraging for me, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I think for the qualitative scholars, probably uh, most of uh, the cases, I mean, we cannot do the interviews uh, with the um, uh, legislative makers or the elite um, um, rank people. So I was wondering like, is it like one year or two years or three years? I mean, if there is any kind of standard time frame that we can actually refer to until like uh, we actually give up the whole process of um, submitting the paper or um, should I just um, make an uh, other attempt or something like that? So that's first question. And second question is related um, um, to the uh, part that we make some kind of suggestion about the reviewer that I want to avoid sometimes. So it's kind of sensitive question, I think, and it's kind of small question. So I was wondering who I should consult with actually. So I, sometimes we meet with some people frequently in the conferences, uh, especially in the subfield uh, conferences very often. and. I personally met with uh, some very well-known scholar and um, sometimes that really specific person gives me, um, frankly speaking, not really well rational <laughs> reasoned um, criticisms um, sometimes. And I really just don't wanna uh, uh, meet her or him as a reviewer. So is it a bad reason that I mentioned specific person's name as a um, potential person that I want to avoid as a reviewer. So that's my second question. Lastly, um, so as a junior scholar, I sometimes get the request to review uh, a manuscript. And I was wondering that, so there's always this um, line that I can write only to the editors. Uh, it's not uh, available to see for the reviewers. I was wondering what I need to actually write on that part. Should I just make as a blank or something like that? Um, what, what will be the suggestion from uh, this wonderful scholars I was wondering about? So thank you everyone. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, very practical and very important questions. John? Uh, you know, let me uh, try to address them real quickly, and, and perhaps other members of the panel can chime in. But as in terms of the time frame of question, right? Uh, I actually think that's not real. That's not that important. I think that uh, most general review, general journals, uh, think of uh, scholarship as transcending time and place. That's why more recently, APSR published a lot of work that deal with historical archives. I mean, from the distant past, some from the Middle Ages. Because uh, if it's true, then, and it's theoretically important, it should transcend time and place. So I would never give up on even qualitative work, because I find quality very, very, very rich. I mean, you know, one of the pieces that we published uh, was about, uh, oh, now I've heard, Sarah Parkinson, who did field work uh, among Palestinian women about a decade ago. Uh, it was one of the best pieces we've ever published, one of the best pieces of qualitative work. Uh, and, and it was dated, and she told me it was dated. And I told her to submit it anyhow, because it addresses a fundamentally important research question 
important. That is how rebel groups rebuild themselves after being defeated and the role women play in rebuilding that organization. I would never give up on it. There is no time frame in my view. Now, others may disagree. I, I mean, I think maybe some subfield journals might disagree, but for as far as the general journals, no, time frame does not really matter. Uh, the second the thing about reviewer wanting to avoid, this is pretty tricky because we live in a small world uh, that there, and especially in the subfields, we pretty much know each other, right? Uh, and editors will be looking for people to review your piece. And I have to say that you can, you can say, I, I, you can offer any objection you want, right? But when it comes down to it, editors don't have a big pool to draw on. And so they're looking for anyone who says yes. That's why, by the way, editors aren't you know, strategically manipulating the reviewer pool to make sure you're not published, unlike what I think people think. We actually send out requests and whoever says yes, we include. So it, it, it will try to avoid someone you uh, object to. Uh, for whatever reason. But if it is someone who can speak competently about your piece, we probably will ask that person. But, uh, you know, you can go ahead and say why. You can say that this person is highly critical of my piece or my work publicly. And, and, and you know, you're pretty sure that they just don't like it. They're, they're, they're like what Professor Wu pointed out, people who just hate your work, right? And that it might, they might know who you are, which would jeopardize confidentiality and anonymity. So you could frame it that way. And I, I would consider that a legitimate request. Uh, and third, um, yeah, about junior scholars and getting a request to review, what do you have to do in the private comments? Well, you don't have to fill those out. You're not required to fill out private comments. That's only if you feel compelled to offer private comments. Like you wanted to say, well, I, often it'll come like this. We have like four categories, like except, um, minor revision, major revision, reject. And someone will say, well, I was unsure about major revision and reject, but I'm going to write you privately saying that uh, I wanted to be nice, so I said major revision. So they'll say something like that. that that's what usually to sort of uh, explain a little bit better in more fine detail why they made the recommendation they did. But, you know, you don't have, you're not required to put in private comments. Uh, and, and, and so don't feel like you have to. Okay. I'll just add on the uh, the um, the second second question. So what I'll I'll what I will probably do is that um, this person knows this work, right? So this is not double blind anymore. So I think that that could be a good reason why you can object to a, a particular reviewer. Thank, good you. Point. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So we have a professor uh, Yi Sang Wan, a former president of KAIS uh, here as a truly senior scholar. Uh, so uh, please uh, uh, provide Every some view, all right? Yeah, last word <laughs> for this panel, please. Uh, what am I talking about? Uh, anyway, in this panel, the, uh, all the panelists uh, are academic monsters. I'm normal, more like human beings. So anyway, <laughs> John, I would like to ask a, a Quick, simple question, not a, uh, not a real question, actually. Sometimes you presented your papers more than uh, 10 papers a year at the academic conference, also published the four or five uh, 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 articles in journal. So sometimes I'm, I'm curious about that. So you just enjoy that or the, uh, is, is that your academic strategy? I know the at the Michigan State, the, everyone liked you so much. You know, you are so, sociable, right? I know that, but the, uh, I'm, I'm, you are so marvelous. Anyway, yeah, that's what I want to say now. Okay, John, your response. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are not normal, you know. <laughs> uh, Sang-wan has been a friend of mine for 40, oh, 30 years now, right? At least 30 years, yes. So 40 just, years, you know, 40, in 1985, you know. Oh, that's, a, oh, that's right. <laughs> 40 years. <laughs> Almost, well, uh, 30, 60, that, exactly, yeah. That's right, that's right. I mean, so, yeah, and, you know, Michigan State, uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of it came from there, you know, that, uh, I, you know, I, I, this is, I, I, I love what I do. I do. I mean, I can't think of doing anything other than this. And I, I really enjoy uh, learning things. And, you know, you, you mentioned conference papers. You, you know what I do is that uh, 
and, and you know this well, you know, you take classes in graduate school, you do all the seminars and at Michigan State, they suddenly said, now go write a dissertation. And, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I have always had papers to write or, you know, thing, assignments to hand in. But now I have to write a dissertation and no one is telling me what to do. So I, 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 early on, I thought that conferences were a good external motivator. That if I applied to write a paper for a conference, that would give me a deadline, an externally imposed deadline. And I would use conferences to finish up my dissertation, <laughs> my chapters, and then use conferences to, you know, uh, explore a topic I wanted to explore and submit it for a journal. So, and you know, uh, conferences are nice because they're they're externally imposed uh, kinds of uh, deadlines, but also conferences are an opportunity to network with people, uh, to see my old friends like Yi Sang Wan, <laughs> MPSA or APSA or ISA, right? Uh, oh, sure. or, or or to you know network with other people that I'd like to meet. Um, one thing I've I've looked at after now, geez, now almost forty years is that uh, there, we don't live in a very big world, but I have a network of a lot of friends or people that I know that has turned out to help my graduate students because they'll say, my graduate students say, well, I'll be applying to so and such and such a university. And like, oh, I know the chair. <laughs> I've known the chair for 30 years. Or I know this person or that person. And that, that helps. But I also think that conferences were a good way for me to um, I enjoy them. I enjoy meeting. I, I, I was always intellectually stimulated by panels that I attended. Not, not just the panels that I was on, but panels that I actually attended that gave me new ideas. And so I like traveling. I like going to conferences uh, and I use them as deadlines to finish my own paper. So it fed on each other. So yeah, uh, Isang Wan, that, that's why I do what I do. It. I think it's a lot of fun. Okay, so um, it's been almost two hours business we have handled so nicely, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, so for the final words, I'm old enough to know the old, the old axiom, like a publish or perish. <laughs> so uh, that's the principle uh, we have signed up onto. And I really enjoyed uh, this panel. I've learned a lot uh, from this panel. and. Especially thank uh, John Ishiyama uh, for sharing your wonderful ideas and very useful perspectives uh, as well. Uh, and uh, my thank uh, goes to uh, as well to uh, brilliant uh, discussions, Professor Kim Nam Gyu and Professor Wu Pyong Wan, uh, the guys I love so much. <laughs> so uh, I think we have to stop here. Uh, so. Uh, this is the panel uh, we have uh, truly appreciated, and uh, let's stop there. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.